live stream. A YouTube link will be provided 24 to 48 hours after the meeting has taken place on our web page. Also, the meeting will continue to be broadcasted with a closed ca with closed captioning on Comcast Xfinity channels 25 and 1085, Verizon FiOS channels 39 and 40, uh, 24 to 48 hours after the meeting has taken place. Please check the Planning Commission website for further information. Audio of tonight's meeting will be available via phone. If commissioners, presenters, or speakers lose internet connectivity during tonight's meeting, please reconnect with us by phone. For other presenters and speakers joining us through Microsoft Teams, please keep your phones and devices muted until you're called upon. Please turn off sound to any other devices around you to minimize interference, and please keep your cameras off until the clerk calls upon you to speak. When you're called upon to speak, please unmute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon that's located on your meeting command bar. The moderator does not have the ability to unmute you. Once you've spoken, please turn your cameras off. If you are dialing in by phone, please, please press star six to unmute. Public speakers, you'll be called upon by the clerk at an assigned time. Pre-registration to speak at tonight's hearing was required, and we are not able to accommodate additional speakers. I do wanna note something here, and I know that we've said this several times at our meetings. Um, registration for uh, speaking at a planning commission meeting, a hearing is required 24 hours in advance of the Monday meeting. Um, so, you know, just a, a reminder for any upcoming meetings that in order to speak at either Monday or Wednesday, registration needs to happen 24 hours in advance of the Monday meeting. And to ensure that you are also um, included on the list of speakers, please note that you will have received a confirmation email. So if you believe yourself to have registered and um, are on the list, if you did not get the confirmation email, you are not a registered speaker. So please make sure that you reach out to us in advance of the Monday meeting so that you are on the list to speak. Um, um, speakers will have two minutes to comment as an individual and three minutes to comment as a representative of a county approved commission. OK, so if you are a, a person who is uh, appointed to one of our commissions, you are permitted to have three minutes to speak. Otherwise, you have two minutes to speak tonight. A timer will be displayed on the screen when speaking virtually. Speakers in person will follow the timer on the podium. Thank you so much. If you are dialing in by phone and unable to see the screen, we will provide an audible 30 second warning. You'll be muted when your time has concluded. The meeting chat is active for presenters or commissioners who need technical assistance only. Please do not use the meeting chat for discussion, public comment, question about agenda items, or requests for more information. All public comment must be shared verbally for the record during the assigned public testimony period. And then of course, this is a public forum. Tonight's meeting will be recorded and posted to the county website via a link to, the U to YouTube as stated. All information associated with tonight's meeting, whether written or spoken, is subject to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act requirements. Um, we know that we are going to have a wonderful discussion tonight, and we thank you for being here. Madam Clerk, can we please call the first item? Yes, beginning as item number five for the evening. This is the Plan Langston Boulevard Plan, the PLBP for GP. 362-23-1 and ZOA-23-11. ZOA this is the adoption of the Langston Boulevard Area Plan and its associated amendments to the General Land Use Plan, the GLUP, the Master Transportation Plan, MTP, and the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance, the Arlington ZOA. We have uh, Mrs. Natasha Alfonso to speak on this item today. Thank you, Giselle and members of the board. Good evening again. My name is Natasha Alfonso Ahmed with the planning division. I'm joined tonight here in person and virtually by other team members in other divisions, including uh, DES, DPR and AED. So we are in the final phase of a, again, a multi-phase planning study, which began in 2019 to develop a comprehensive plan, a high level vision for the Langston Boulevard corridor that will guide both public and private investment long-term. It includes policies, recommendations, and design guidelines to support the goals and vision of a green main street, as well as implementation strategies. We're here tonight to present the plan and to request that the Planning Commission recommend adoption to the County Board of the Plan and Associated Amendments, 
which I will describe in more detail at the end of the presentation. So the planning process has provided multiple engagement opportunities since the beginning of the study. Most recently, our engagement for the first draft, which was released in June of this year, included several methods to collect community input. We also briefed multiple commissions and advisory boards and held a, a county board work session to seek feedback on the plan's recommendations and staff's perspectives related to community concerns. At the end of September, staff released the second draft, uh, also known as the RTA draft, request to advertise. In October, we presented the RTA draft to the Planning Commission and County Board, and the board approved the request to advertise for public hearings in November. Through extensive feedback, we heard support for the planning policies, as well as concerns on several topics, including the plan's scale and extent of change, and the potential impacts of the transformation of the corridor on existing businesses. The plan's vision for increased housing supply and affordability, building height recommendations and strategies for historic preservation, the elements required to create a multimodal corridor and accommodate new growth, the overall supply, access, and ownership of new public spaces, the strategies for managing stormwater and greeting the corridor, and the implementation of the plan. So at the County Board RTA hearing on October 14th, the main topics of discussion centered around housing, building heights, and sustainability. Other topics of discussion included ground floor priority areas, street, uh, street grid expansion, parking, the timing of transit and transportation improvements, and the timing for the review of the East Falls Church and Cherrydale plans. Along with the advertisement of the public hearings, the County Board approved two revisions. The first was to remove a policy recommendation for consolidation of public uses, including recreational facilities and activities, and the second was to change the timing for considering the review of the Cherrydale and East Falls Church adopted plans to short term. In my presentation tonight, I will provide a final, uh, sorry, a brief overview of the discussion with the County Board around the key topics of concern and information on what has changed from the RTA draft to the final draft to address the concerns that we heard. So the plan's policies and recommendations are centered around economic sustainability, environmental resilience, and equity. The plan proposes goals and policies for nine key planning elements supported by design principles and guidelines related to the built environment and public realm. The plan's policies and goals is to incentivize positive change in the core areas that can meet the county's goals and the, and the community's aspirations by providing other choices besides by right development, which will only exacerbate the problems that we have today. The corridor lacks mixed use development that supports a walkable Main Street environment, and the housing mix provides limited opportunities for lower middle income households. To achieve the vision for a green Main Street, a new land use framework is needed that concentrates development in the core areas to support commercial activity, expanded residential uses and densities, and access to new public spaces. To support this land use framework, <clears throat> the use maps indicate where mixed use development and other uses are recommended and identify ground floor priority areas, which are areas where the ground floor should remain non-residential and where spaces should be built as commercial ready and able to support retail or retail equivalent uses when the market can deliver. At the RTA hearing, there was discussion about designating street frontages near the Lee Heights shops property as gold per the retail plan. The Gold Street designation is recommended at key intersections of Langston Boulevard and arterial streets where there is greater access to customers due to traffic volumes. The Blue Street designation is identified in other areas, such as the Lehigh shops, to provide greater flexibility and diversity for retail or retail equivalent uses. Staff continues to recommend the Blue Street designation in areas between the key intersections to avoid requiring higher design standards that may affect project feasibility or result in commercial vacancy. That said, the blue designation does not preclude spaces from being built with interior and exterior features that support retail and retail equivalent uses. There were no changes to the final draft as a result of this discussion. The 2015 Affordable Housing Master Plan projected 2,500 affordable units by 2040 for Langston Boulevard through a combination of existing and new committed and market rate affordable units. This projection was based on the anticipated need for affordable housing countywide and not on an actual development analysis of the corridor. Using this 25 year projection as an aspirational number, the potential housing supply and affordable units were studied during the development of the 2022 preliminary concept plan, 
the draft that was released in June of this year and the RTA draft that was released at the end of September. Based on these analysis, um, staff has concluded that there is a range for what can be achieved along the corridor. The total potential units in the planning area based on this plan's recommendations ranges between 19,000 to 26,000 units or approximately 9,400 to 1,600 net new units and is expected to be delivered over approximately five decades out to 2075. The potential or the total potential affordable units would also grow incrementally and could ultimately range between 3,200 to 3,800 units. The table on this slide compares the current distribution of affordable units to the potential distribution by neighborhood area. The projected affordability is expected to remain distributed across the corridor with the greatest share in areas three and five west. The supply of affordable units may be increased in the future if sites contribute more than what is assumed, if land is acquired by nonprofit developers, and through further redevelopment in the Cherrydale and East Falls Church neighborhoods guided by either current or updated plans. At the RTA hearing, the County Board discussed the PC's recommendation for conducting additional study of the planning area <clears throat> or as part of the affordable housing master plan to propose other ways for preserving or building new affordable housing the potential timing for conducting a housing needs analysis and how many affordable units would be achievable by 2040 in Area 5 West. The current recommendations provide robust strategies to retain and increase affordable housing along the corridor. The plan's projections are based on more detailed analysis of the potential development, which is balanced with community input and interests for change along the corridor. Redevelopment will take time based on normal market factors and pace of growth and will occur when property owners are interested in bringing forward applications. If further study is needed to identify new tools, staff recommends it be considered through a countywide effort related to a review of the affordable housing master plan, rather than conducting additional analysis of the planning area, which we've already looked at extensively. <clears throat> the last countywide housing needs analysis was completed in 2020 and 2021. The next analysis would occur no sooner than 2025. Additionally, the county intends to complete the multifamily reinvestment study, which is another effort that can help realize affordable housing opportunities around the county where multifamily development exists today. The final draft includes additional language to clarify that the 2015 affordable housing master plan projection is not a target or a goal, and is expected to be achieved through a combination of existing and new affordable units. It includes additional data on the potential affordable units along the corridor by 2040 and 2075 and clarification on the affordable housing expectations for base site plan and bonus density levels. The policies on building form are aimed at achieving context sensitive building design that fosters a healthy urban environment, enhancing connections to nature and retrofitting surface parking with landscaping to reduce impervious surfaces. At the RTA hearing, the County Board discussed if the proposed building height limits could be adjusted for special exception applications, and the specific proposed height limits at the southeast corner of North George Mason Drive and Langston Boulevard, which is adjacent to the Halls Hill Highview Park community. Staff does not recommend lowering the heights at the southeast corner of North George Mason Drive, as doing so would limit opportunities for lot consolidation, which is needed to achieve multimodal improvements along Langston Boulevard and other plan goals. The parcels have sufficient space to provide building height transitions to low density residential edges. The final draft clarifies that the building height maps represent the maximum height limits and appropriate tapering. However, under extraordinary circumstances, the County Board does have the ability to permit something greater within the zoning district regulations. The policies on transportation focus on creating complete streets that connect the surrounding neighborhoods and areas to the corridor and increase transit use. At the RTA hearing, the County Board discussed the residents' objection to the proposed extension of 25th Road North behind the Harrison Shopping Center, the Chamber's recommendation for a parking plan, and the timing for investing in enhanced transit services. Staff continues to recommend enhancements to the street network in all neighborhood areas including at the Harrison uh, Shopping Center site to allow for access to new development to be completed and consolidated and to be and to help reduce driveways and improve safety for all users. As we have noted before, 
The road design will be determined during site plan review, which includes community input. In terms of the parking plan, the policy to coordinate open parking agreements provides staff a mechanism to evaluate parking needs as sites redevelop. And before significant transit enhancements can be provided, substantial transformation of the corridor must take place, which as we know requires redevelopment. The final draft amends policy TC9 to clarify pedestrian and bicycle crossings should be improved along all roads, not just Langston Boulevard, and adds a definition for enhanced bicycle facilities. Staff presented the final draft to the Transportation Commission on October 26. The discussion focused on the new street connections. Staff clarified that the county does not expect to use eminent domain to expand the street grid and that the specific type, location, and configuration of those connections will be determined during the site plan review process. There are 24 existing public spaces in the planning area. Through this plan, there's a potential to achieve up to 28 new spaces in the core area over time in the form of plazas and parks. That's almost 6.5 acres of land and an additional 17,000 linear feet of public space in the form of greenways, which are pedestrian and bicycle connections. The RTA draft included a few changes to the public spaces map for Area 5 West to address concerns from the Lion Village Shopping Center property owner. The June draft initially proposed two public spaces on the northeast corner of the site based on the owner's concerns about service and loading access and conflicts of use. And based on further staff analysis, the RTA draft was adjusted and the recommendation instead is to include a 5,000 square foot street level plaza at the south corner of the site, an elevated pedestrian bicycle connection along the rear of the site, and improvements to existing public land surrounding the trail to enhance visibility and access to the trail. Additionally, language was added to clarify that buildings near the entrances to the Custis Trail should have a minimum 20 foot setback to widen and enhance the entrance to the trail and should provide design features on the ground and upper stories that support activity and encourage eyes on the trail. So per the County Board's action during the RTA hearing, this final draft does not include the public facilities policy number eight and strategy number seven, which spoke to the consolidation of public uses and recreational facilities and activities, and instead references the PSMP recommendation in the body of the report and includes language to clarify that when any future studies of the Lee and Langston Brown Community Center sites are conducted, that it is done with public input. Staff presented the final draft to the Park and Rec Commission on October 24th. The discussion focused on tree canopy targets, sports and other recreational facilities, and the design of plazas. Staff clarified that tree canopy targets in urban areas are typically lower than the county's overall target because, available plant, because of available plantable space and opportunities for adding space is limited. Additionally, staff clarified that land is limited in the planning area and the types of recreational amenities provided at larger scale sites may not be possible to replicate. Lastly, the PSMP provides design guidelines for privately owned public spaces, including plazas. Amenities such as tennis courts are determined based on need and at site plan review. The plan recommends specific tree canopy targets for private development as well as public parks and, and um, APS facilities. It also recommends detention and overland relief in specific locations where new parks, plazas, or greenways are recommended as part of redevelopment to detain water or provide a, a safe path for the water to flow. The final plan includes additional language to clarify that implementation of this plan will promote long-term climate adaptation and resiliency. To implement the plan, staff recommends several amendments to the general land use plan map and booklet, the master transportation plan map and zoning ordinance for action now with the plan adoption. The GLUP amendments include establishing the Langston Boulevard Planning District, Text and text within the GLUP booklet to realize the plan's goals through new GLUP policy and zoning tools. Adding open space triangles on the GLUP to indicate generally where public spaces are desired. Removing parcels within the Cherrydale Revitalization District, adjacent to areas where redevelopment has already occurred per the Cherrydale plan goals to allow for expanded housing options and removing the overlapping HTD designations for parcels in the core area given the establishment of the new planning district and new guidance for multifamily residential properties. The MTP uh, amendments include adding the Langston Boulevard Planning District boundary as a new area plan for new streets on the MTP map, 
and amending the second page of the map to note that this is an area with new planned on street bike lanes. The zoning ordinance amendments include clarifying that townhouses will only be allowed by site plan within the Langston Boulevard uh, planning district and amending the CO 2.5 zoning district preamble to clarify that it can apply to areas outside of Metro transit corridors so that the zoning tool can be used along the corridor. In addition to these amendments, the plan establishes a future land use plan, which makes recommendations for future land use designations on sites with the greatest incentives and opportunities for change and identifies existing zoning districts that correspond with the recommended GLUB designation for implementation. Requests for GLUB amendments and rezonings would be expected with site plan and rezoning applications. For sites with limited incentives and opportunities for change, the plan indicates that after plan adoption and in the near term, staff will continue to evaluate and bring forward recommendations for appropriate GLUB and zoning implementation tools. The final draft changed the timing for re-examining the East Falls Church Cher uh, Cherido plans to midterm, clarified expectations from site plan projects for both base site plan density and bonus density levels, and clarified that optional increases in density above by right levels are allowed within maximum building height limits. Staff presented the final draft to the Economic Development Commission on October 10th. The discussion focused on the importance of retaining and expanding retail and striking the right balance between needs, wants, and economic feasibility, and their desire for county-initiated GLUP amendments to provide greater incentives to owners and stimulate reinvestment. Staff continues to recommend GLUP amendments at time of site plan application as county-initiated amendments limit opportunities for bonus density and for achieving critical plan goals. This concludes my presentation. Therefore, um, staff requests that the Planning Commission again recommend adoption to the County Board of the plan and the associated implementation amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers? Well, we may just have a few. <laughs> So I will be calling the names of the speakers two by two. And when you hear your name, please begin to move up to the front of the podium. If you can hear me on our virtual call as well, please listen out for your name. I will be calling the virtual speakers first. Our first speaker for the evening is Gillian Burgess, followed by, oh, the list has changed. Okay, just let's just get Gillian Burgess up on the screen, please. Thank you. Hi, it's Gillian. Hello. Hi. Do, let me know when you're ready. I'm not sure. I we're, we're ready. Trying to get the virtual clock, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not showing on the Teams as a presentation on the Teams. So. Um, okay. Well, I will just. Okay, I, I will start. I can't see a clock, just so you Okay, know. I'll give you a 30 um, second warning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jillian Burgess and I live in Cherrydale, just a block from Langston Boulevard. I'm here to say yes in my backyard and enthusiastically support Plan Langston Boulevard's vision of a more dynamic, diverse, and dense late Langston Boulevard corridor that supports pe people getting around sustainably and safely. Specifically, I support more housing, including affordable housing, distributed retail, protected bike lanes, and wide sidewalks in my backyard. I also appreciate the updated boundaries to the Cherrydale Revitalization District. We've been talking about this vision for years. It is time to adopt this plan. I do, however, have some suggestions for improvement. Um, I believe you'll hear from for, uh, from others about the, the need to increase affordable housing along Langston, and I support added heights to meet our affordable housing goals. Secondly, about those bicycle facilities, I appreciate that, that staff has attempted to define the, the term. I think we've just, we haven't quite gotten there yet. The plan should align, this plan should align with the bicycle element of the master transportation plan. And it needs to define both enhanced bicycle facilities and enhanced bicycle lanes, because both terms are used in the plan, as low stress bicycle facilities that comply with the de design guidance in the Appendix C you of the seconds, uh, I mean. great of the bicycle element of the master transportation plan. Without that important detail, we could get 
unprotected bike lanes that we expect our students to use to get to Dorothy Hand Middle School, just as an example. We need to be clear there. And then finally, the Custis Trail must be widened. This plan must call for a widened Custis Trail between Oak Street and Beach Street and for a two-way cycle track on the north side of Langston Thank you Boulevard so much. To Thank take, you for your time. take things off of the trail between Beach and Kirkwood. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lander Allen, followed by John Aubenberger. All right, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Good evening to everybody. Hey, I'm here to, tonight to ask you to approve this plan. Um, there's a lot to like in it, and it's been through a very thorough and comprehensive process. That said, it doesn't go far enough. Leaving out Sherrydale and East Falls Ch Church were huge mistakes. Both areas need to be addressed immediately, not in three years, as the county board has suggested. My biggest concern is the failure of the plan to effectively address climate change and the rapid warming of the earth. Climate change is gonna dramatically change our way of life. Hundreds of millions of people are likely to be forced out of their homes by rising seas. Many millions of others will face hunger and starvation as more and more crops fail due to heat and drought. Some areas of the globe will become uninhabitable due to unbearable temperatures. This is not something that might happen. It's already begun to happen. We must change the world the way we live if we hope to survive. Changes will be inconvenient and unwelcome by some, but not nearly as inconvenient and deadly as what will happen if we don't act. There are steps we can take to act, to take locally to do our part to address this. One is to increase our density so we make our carbon footprint smaller. Suburban housing development produces twice as much carbon as urban. We should be building a lot more housing on our major corridors, including Langston Boulevard, where we can take advantage of viable transportation alternatives instead of forcing people to live in ever-growing, sprawling suburbs. This additional housing would also address the ongoing housing shortage. The plan doesn't go enough, far enough to address the car-oriented nature of Langston 30 Boulevard. seconds left. The plan is heavily skewed towards favoring cars over every other mode of transportation. We should be doing more to provide viable transportation options to everybody, not just those who can afford cars. Going forward, we have to do more, a lot more, and we have to act with a real sense of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Obenberger, followed by Wells Harrell. Mr. Obenberger. Okay. Our next speaker is Wells Harrell, followed by Alice Hogan. Okay, our next speaker is Alice Hogan, followed by Rebecca Roper. Good evening, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Thank you, I'm Alice Hogan. I'm speaking for the Alliance for Housing Solutions this evening. Um, I would like to thank the staff for the incredible work, um, the LBA, the community, all these commissions. It's an amazing plan. Um, we do support the plan with a few um, additional caveats. You know, the staff did a great job with the 13 housing policy elements, including our equity issues, noting about demographics in the community. That this corridor is much wider, much wealthier, and has many fewer housing options than the rest of the county. It suffers from income and historical racism, uh, racist segregation. When we look at the calves that they mention in the plan, there are literally 263 calves that are actually um, subsidized versus marks, bringing it up to 800. The goal is 2,500. So we have 1,700 just to get to that goal. And many of those are marks that are also at risk. So our, uh, um, our job is very, very big. It's bigger than 2,500. So to have it not reach that is really disappointing. Um, the staff notes we need 30% units and we need housing for adults, older adults. So there's a lot of work to be done. You know, the, it, the staff acknowledges in this plan that as the plan stands right now, it is limited in what it can achieve. And that's why we're not hearing 2,500 because there's not enough height. There's not enough density. We don't have the tools to bear to bring to bear to make that happen. And so while this plan will go forward, I really encourage this commission to think about and articulate what are the things that the county could be doing as soon as this passes 
to um, move us closer to that 2,500. And that includes these Falls Church and Cherrydale reviews. There's some confusion about what was passed. And so we need a clarification on when those will be considered. We need additional tools, as staff said, that can look at the whole county, but we can't wait till 2025 to Thank look you, at Ms. tools Hogan. we need. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Ruper, followed by Jane Green. Yes. Let's get your mic on. There you Sorry. go. And, uh, and area three, page 69. So next slide, please. So with respect to climate change, I actually have a one story home, which is unusual in Arlington. I have solar panels and I've, what you can see on the first left is an aerial view. This is the area near Halls Hills Fire Station 8, which preceded all of us. So we were glad to buy in that area. My concern are, are a couple of concerns. Uh, first of all, is the height of the, the buildings across the street that may be built on the south side of 22nd Road North that would be of such a height at five stories that it would actually would block our ability to use our current solar power and limit other folks. It's a very short little area. That's one area for consideration. Second of all, the cut through with respect from Langston Boulevard to Burlington Street, I think nuisance noise has not been really well considered, needs to be considered. If there would be a greenway, I really encourage the plan to be modified to require uh, representation from areas to inform the greenway so then they meet the needs of the areas. Um, a density with respect to along this little area, um, my preference would be to have single family homes, townhouses to allow for uh, the density, but also cap the height because of the solar panel consideration. So um, uh, thank you very much. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jane Green, followed by Wells Harrell. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Jane Green. I live near and I travel along Langston Boulevard. Um, I'm asking that you recommend that the county board adopt the Langston Boulevard area plan, and we do need to adopt this plan without delay. But we cannot forget that we are looking at a plan that will only meet about half of our goal for this corridor as we've laid it out in the affordable housing master plan. Why is this the best that we can do? Why do we have to ask to pass a plan that won't meet one of our core community goals? I think we need to take a hard look at these questions and figure out why our much celebrated Arlington Way is holding us back. But in the meantime, we must do everything we can to make the Langston Boulevard area plan as strong as possible now. So this means a path to get as close as we can to the 2,500 CAF units with a special focus on getting units for folks earning 30% or less of the area median income. We need to have a specific date in the short term, um, which we will have the East Falls Church and Cherrydale area plans to be scheduled for reconsideration. Um, we need a concrete plan to explore additional development tools that will bring more CAFs to Langston Boulevard through both redevelopment uh, reconstruction and through preservation. And we need a commitment um, to add more money to the affordable housing investment fund in the next in the next budget so we can re realize more affordable housing units in this area. Thank you. Wells Harrell is followed by Grace Herpe. Good evening, Chair Patel, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Wells Harrell. I'm the uh, chair of the NAACP Arlington Branches Housing Committee, and I'm speaking uh, tonight in support of the uh, Planning Commission recommending that the county board adopts the Langston Boulevard plan. My comments tonight are not about that decision that you have to make tonight. Instead, they're about the decisions that you'll face in the future as you review the development projects that come to you for recommendation. First, the Planning Commission should use every tool at its disposal to maximize the production of affordable housing. As you have heard already, and as you'll hear others say, I'm sure the affordable housing master plan goal of 2,500 can't be met, at least based on current projections by this plan. It means we need to do everything possible to get that number as high as we can. Chair Patel said it best earlier this year, every project needs to have on-site affordable housing, period, every single project. That is all the more important along this corridor which tends to be wider and wealthier than the county as a whole. 
Second, the Planning Commission should also use every tool at its disposal to prevent displacement, not just of vulnerable residents, but also locally owned businesses. Where a property with market rate affordable homes is proposed for redevelopment, those homes should be replaced with at least as many CAFs, and ideally many more. That's the usual process that we follow here in Arlington with our local affordable housing developers, but it is important for the Planning Commission to provide that message and to serve as an important backstop. And next, where a property with local businesses ten as tenants is proposed for redevelopment, those businesses should be given a fair opportunity, a real chance, a fair shot. 30 seconds. In space. As we said in our September 29th letter, the Langston Boulevard plan presents a once in a generation opportunity for the county. It will be up to you to ensure that its vision for more affordable homes and thriving legacy businesses becomes a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Grace Pay, followed by Michael Gehring. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Grace Jerpy, um, and I'm here to voice my support for going forward and passing the current version of the Plan Langston plan. Um, that said, I think it's a time to reflect on why we are not coming close to meeting our goal of 2,500 committed affordable units for the corridor. I think this largely comes down to viewing density and viewing new neighbors as a burden and a negative, which is simply not the case. Um, on every metric imaginable, denser housing is better for our county. Lower carbon emissions, it's better for the county budget, uh, takes people out of cars, um, improves quality of life, and allows more people to live near their jobs, near where they want to live. These are all good things. Um, simply on the committed affordable front, um, if we had allowed more height along more area of the corridor, we would have had more committed affordable units in market rate developments. We'd have more money for AHIF from developer contributions. Um, also, when fully committed affordable projects were built, we could have more committed affordable units. Um, this is not to mention that by allowing more density, we would have had more money to spend in the county budget on our affordable housing uh, investment fund. We need to be paying at least $40 million into that per year uh, to be meeting our goals from the plan countywide, and we're simply not. In a good year, we're paying maybe 50% of that. Um, so it's my hope that we pass this plan, but Arlington's always planning. That's something I know as a resident. As we're looking forward into future plans earlier on in the process, you know, I hope we can view density as a good thing and see it as an opportunity and not a burden. So thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is Michael Gearing, followed by Sarah Montana. Good evening. My name is Mike Gearing, and I'm a uh, longtime uh, Arlington County resident. And I want to come out. I wanted to come out tonight and voice my full support for the plan Langston Boulevard. Um, I have uh, many reasons to support this plan, uh, so I'll just point out uh, two. Uh, main reasons. Uh, the first being uh, affordable housing and the great need for affordable housing. Um, uh, uh, Langston Boulevard only has about 5% um, five percent of the affordable housing in the county. And uh, I think uh, for that reason, uh, the um, uh, it would be a great opportunity to expand af affordable housing in the north uh, s uh, sector of the county in instead of uh, focusing strictly on the cluster of, of affordable housing in the south part of the county. So, um, uh, and uh, secondly, I I believe that um, um, the the plan would offer a great opportunity to redesign the corridor to make it more. Uh, pedestrian friendly and less car dependent. And um, it would be a, a great opportunity to, uh, you know, um, the uh, corridor is a uh, one big highway that runs through many uh, neighborhoods and it's, uh, you know, uh, very uh, dangerous to walk and to bike along that corridor. So I hope, oh, and I think um, it would be a great opportunity to redesign that area make it more, uh, uh, people friendly and uh, we could put more um, uh, public train, um, you know, op more options for public uh, transit. And, um, but uh, I could go on about other points, but uh, those are the two main points I wanna make. And I thank you for your time. 
Our next speaker is Sarah Montana, followed by Philip Carter. Good evening. My name is Sarah Montana, and my wife and I moved here last year from Manassas because we wanted a more walkable, bikeable, equitable community. And we wanted for others to access all of the access, the education, the transportation, you name it, that's a part of this community. Um, Langston's functionally our backyard. We live across from Mom's Market, and I walk and bike frequently to all kinds of businesses along Wilson and Clarendon, but it's notable that I don't find myself biking to businesses along Langston because it, I don't find myself safe to get there. Um, so there's much to applaud in this plan, and I hope you will pass it without delay. There are a couple of points um, that I think could threaten the success of it that I would love to see. Um, first, I appreciate the potential of the activity hub design uh, for concentrating attention on key areas, but I do worry that by priority placement there, we are risking nodes of walkability, pockets of walkability, without access between those activity hubs. And so I would love to see an emphasis on the transportation between those, the biking, the walking, the bus access between those hubs. Even better, expand development entirely along that corridor so we truly have a continuous corridor rather than those simple nodes. Um, second, second, the maximum base height here um, and even smaller between those activity hubs, it really risks not being large enough to create the kind of density that allows for the kinds of investments that we want to see in that community. Um, stormwater management, infrastructure investments like parks, accessible features. Um, if we really wanna accelerate the redevelopment that this plan depends on and come anywhere near that 2,500, which we're nowhere near right now, um, we're gonna need to see taller maximum base height, not only in those activity hubs, but also between them. Um, so I'm excited about the future that I can see for my family since moving here um, and the community that I moved here for. I hope you will help make a reality. Thank you for your time. Philip Carter is followed by Joseph Keyes. Our next speaker will be Joseph Keyes, followed by Timothy Dugan. Good evening. My name is Joseph Keyes. I'm speaking on behalf of Voice. We have here a visionary plan for Langston Boulevard with much to be proud of. However, plan falls short in affordable housing. Voice is pleased that the board amended the draft to move the re-examination of land use plans for Cherrydale and East Falls Church to short term on the timeline. There are opportunities there for much needed housing. Let us remember, number one, households are suffering under the current housing crisis. And number two, this county is committed to many admirable goals that are tied to the affordable housing supply. For examples, the affordable housing master plan of goal of 2,500 units of affordable housing by 2040 along Langston Boulevard. Second, the new strategic plan, A Way Home for All, which sets its sight on ending homelessness by 2026. Third, the reasonable fair housing, the regional fair housing plan signed in July that aims to, quote, overcome past and current segregation, promote fair housing choices, and create more inclusive communities. And finally, the equity resolution, which asks us to, quote, generate new innovative solutions for full spectrum of housing affordability. More tools are needed to meet these goals along Langston Boulevard as elsewhere. Co-location, better funding of the Affordable Housing Investment Fund, more housing staff, fast track for builders and affordable housing. And for sure, the East Falls Church and Cherrydale plan use plan need to be addressed quickly. It's time to move forward on the vision for the Langston Boulevard corridor, but housing, adequate housing to our needs must be part of the plan. Timothy Dugan is followed by Tim Husson. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tim Dugan of the firm Bean, Kinney and Corman. Tonight I'm speaking about the Lion Village Apartments and the Lion Village Shopping Center. 
As for the Lion Village Apartments, we urge the Planning Commission to recommend designating the property for partial preservation, not full preservation. The buildings are increasingly functionally obsolete. It's impossible to modify them to meet modern building codes, make green, or as their walk-ups, make fully ADA compliable, comp uh, accessible. The Lion Village apartments are located on the edge of on, and are not an essential part of the Lion Village Historic District designation. In the 144-page National Park Service registration form for Lion Village, the Lion Village apartments are mentioned only once on page 108. They're not included in the Statement of Significance, and they're not mentioned in the 19-page Historical Background section. Changing the plan's designation from full uh, to partial preservation instead of full preservation would fairly and accurately reflect the existing conditions. A full preservation designation conflicts with other significant recommendations of the plan. A partial preserva preservation designation would relieve the owner from an unfounded, burdensome, and time-consuming process to eliminate the FP designation during subsequent proceedings. The Lion Village Shopping Center, our concern is with respect to that is plan page Roman 7 SR3. What we recommend is modifying the immutable minimum 35% tree canopy requirement so that it, it provides more flexibility where it, there's overland relief and underground infrastructure to be located, as in the case of the Lion Village Shopping Center. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim Hussan, followed by Jason Schwartz. Hi. I live with my family 100 yards from Langston Boulevard in Maywood, where we've owned a single family home for 11 years. I support this plan. And I say yes in my backyard to smart growth that includes more residential density and yes to more pedestrian, bike, and transit friendly Langston Boulevard. I have two comments. First, I encourage you to be ambitious in incorporating as much res residential density as possible to help face our housing crisis. If we don't increase the residential supply to meet demand, prices for home ownership and for rents will just continue to skyrocket. Arlington will become another San Francisco where our children cannot afford to live and where our teachers, our public sector workers and our nonprofit workers cannot afford to live. Second, I want to point out a very specific change needed in the plan, which is permitted within the RTA. It's essential to preserve the Lee Heights stores and restaurants west of Woodstock Street. To retain this type of retail, it's critical that you designate the area as gold retail, not as blue retail, currently specified by the plan. As the plan now stands, a developer might choose to replace all these storefronts with a gymnasium, for example. To ensure the area is attractive to foot traffic, we need to ensure that new buildings are able to accommodate gold retail, such as restaurants. Therefore, you must designate as gold retail the three block stretch from Woodstock Road to Glebe Road. Thank you very much. Next is Jason Schwartz, followed by David Band. Hi, good evening. My name is Jason Schwartz. I'm speaking on behalf of the Yimbies of Nova. We are excited about this plan and thank staff for their hard work on the plan and community outreach. Over and over and over again, there's been a clear consensus from Arlingtonians that we need more housing. According to the feedback on the preliminary concept plan, over 85% of renters and 55% of homeowners stated that meeting the AHMP goal of 2,500 affordable units is important. At the County Board RTA meeting last month, over 70% of the speakers favored the plan and called for more ambition to meet the AHMP. And even tonight, there's a clear majority supporting more, more housing. Yet this draft plan calls for only 1,400 units affordable to 60% AMI by 2040, which is only 56% of the AHMP goal of 2,500. The allowable heights and overall building footprints are way too small along the corridor. Area 5 in particular can provide much more housing as it is uh, along the Roslyn Boston corridor. To the south of Roslyn Boulevard, there are buildings of 12 stories and higher, right next to garden apartments, townhouses, and single-family houses. Yet this plan limits buildings of these heights to very small concentrated areas along the I-66 highway. One of the Marbella buildings is 12 stories and is right next to townhouses. The proposed Wakefield Manor building is 12 stories and directly adjacent to the Wakefield Manor garden apartments. Buildings like these should be allowed across Area 5, like they are south of Wilson Boulevard. 
We applaud the changes change to move the East Falls Church and Cherrydale area plans to the near term work plan. However, these areas will only increase the net number of new housing units by on the corridor by six to 10 percent. We need to do better and we can achieve our housing goals. We need to be bold and we need to have the courage to do what is right. We need to show our values just not in our words, but in our actions. How can we say we value a diverse and inclusive world class urban community? when We fail to meet our fundamental uh, policy goals. Goal one of our AHMP states that Arlington County shall have me have an shall have an adequate supply of housing available to meet the community need, community needs. This plan is a modest step forward in meeting our housing goals. We urge the planning commission to pass this plan now without delay and take any further action. Don't reduce the housing any further. And um, uh, uh, we look forward to this plan and uh, thank you so much. David Bann is followed by Jane Zimmerman. Good evening, my name is David Bann. I'm an Arlington County resident. Uh, I'm a Rivendell School parent and a member of the Rivendell School Board of Trustees. Uh, tonight I'll be addressing the Langston Area Boulevard Plan, particularly the Lee Center public space next to Rivendell School. Uh, I'm, representing, I'm representing the Rivendell broader community, uh, the Board of Trustees, the faculty and the parents tonight. Uh, we thank you for your chance to speak here and, and being attentive to the concerns. I want to make three points around the Lee Center, uh, around discrepancies, green space and safety concerns. So first around discrepancies, we're very encouraged by some of the commissioner's uh, comments, but we saw discrepancies in the final plan and we've actually pulled together some exhibits, uh, which we're happy to share. You can see the, the green space, the current space, and then on page 33 and on page 65, uh, there's not as much green space in the future Rivendell plan. So I wanted to call that out. Uh, as Arlington grows denser, you'll have more demand for green space uh, with, the, with those future residents. Uh, second, uh, just green space in general, uh, the neighbors are going to want that. And then lastly, traffic is a concern. If we were to add a uh, multi-family large complex there, that could create more parking traffic issues for them. So in summary, uh, thank you for your time, and we encourage you to please continue to seek public uh, input on the Rivendell uh, Lee Center area from the Rivendell community. Thank you. Jane Zimmerman is followed by John Musso. Thank you, I'm Jane Zimmerman, a 30 year resident of Arlington, Virginia, and also a first generation homeowner. I'll, in the interest of time, skip over some of the other concerns that people have stated here, such as affordable housing. But I would like to include other recommendations. That is, no plan should go forward without a clear data-driven analysis of its impact on Arlington Public Schools, including the impact on community centers and park and recreational space. Although the final version of the plan dropped consolidation of community centers, per the request to advertise and the county board vote on October 14th, it indicates that our community centers can and likely will become schools to accommodate the addition of thousands of new residents on the corridor. The Planning Commission should oppose the Langston Brown Moores hub and the effective creation of a mega hub east of Glee, uh, west, of Glee, west of Glebe Road. The county uh, Langston Brown Moores hub was added September 28 without consultation or engagement uh, with residents in areas two and three. It is presented as a separate hub from development at Glebe and Langston, only one block away. Effectively, it creates one mega hub that changes the general land use plan. Also, uh, the Planning Commission should oppose rezoning residential properties in area two and three on North 22nd and North Columbus streets and North Culpeper Road as a matter of policy and law. The county board manager and staff have been notified repeatedly and in writing that changing the GLUP to rezone residential properties there uh, is against the law. Also, uh, again, our uh, neighbors in the Langston Civic Association, ODCA, uh, uh, have asked that uh, building heights in that stretch not uh, exceed five stories. However, they've refused to put that in writing. We need guardrails on this plan to preserve that historic area and its cultural heritage. With that, and in the interest of time, I'll just submit the rest of my statement in writing. Thank you. John Musso is followed by Joan McIntyre. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. I'm John Musso, Government Affairs Manager at the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. On behalf of the Chamber tonight, I am here to ask the, the Commission to recommend the adoption of the Langston Boulevard Area Plan 
um, the general land use plan map and assorted amendments uh, with some revisions. We uh, first of all thank staff and thank the county for the hard work that has led us to this point where we can finally adopt this plan and begin the implementation of this strong vision for Langston Boulevard. We do have certain requests for re uh, revisions to help strengthen the plan and make sure that this uh, plan once implemented um, can really ultimately achieve the goals that we are setting out to um, accomplish. We do appreciate the inclusion of the future GLUP map within the consideration of the plan. Um, the chamber does request that the board, the commission recommend that the board commit to amending the area plan as is to include this des this map as a full GLUP designation. Uh, we understand that staff, as mentioned in the presentation, believe that not initiating this, this, this set of amendments right now would help them better facilitate um, the obtainment of various plan goals, such as affordable housing, stormwater, and so forth. We do urge the commission to recommend that the county board reconsider that um, based on the fact that these amendments once implemented would help provide a certain degree of clarity and um, better understanding for those who wish to invest and build in this corridor, which will ultimately allow so many of these goals to be implemented at a more um, cost-effective and timely rate, particularly affordable housing, which as we've heard so much in this presentation um, is a very big motivator and something that's very important that we get right and do ultimately obtain that level of affordable housing. In addition, we do ask that the commission recommend that the board consider two additional plan goals to this area plan, which are um, the retention and expansion of retail and commercial services, along with the provision of adequate parking resources. This is something we've heard from our members um, several times that the vibrancy of the length and of our corridor is going to depend on a balance of incentives for both residential and commercial development, um, including plan language to provide incentives for retaining and attracting businesses to the corridor is really going to be essential in promoting the quality of life that we really want to see on this corridor. And in addition, we ask that the county consider the inclusion of a parking plan eventually to ensure that there is a sufficient um, amount of accessible parking throughout the corridor, particularly in the commercial nodes, which are really going to be the hub of activity going forward. So thank you very much for your time, and we hope that the commission will consider these requests. Thank you. Joan McIntyre is followed by Sandy Chesrow. Good evening, I'm Joan McIntyre, speaking for the Climate Change, Energy and Environment Commission. We are in a climate crisis and addressing this threat should be a core element in the Langston Boulevard plan. Throughout this year, the evidence of the crisis has been mounting with heat waves, massive storms and intense wildfire. We are on track to be the hottest year on record. The overall vision of the Langston corridor as, as a vibrant transit oriented green main street uh, would, would help pave the way for more sustainable lifestyles, and a number of the policy recommendations touch on the need for climate mitigation and adaptation. However, more prominence and greater clarity should be given to identifying what is required in policy recommendations, design principles, and implementation. Let's be clear, addressing the climate crisis means eliminating the use of fossil fuels for our energy consumption and more broadly, minimizing the carbon footprint of the corridor as the corridor is redeveloped. This means setting the standard for net zero energy or net zero car or zero carbon buildings. Uh, that buildings that in the future need to be, have high energy efficiency, rely on all electric systems, install on-site solar where feasible, and use low and even negative carbon materials. The plan should also be pri prioritized repurposing and renovation of existing multi-story buildings over the demolition and new construction to reduce the life cycle carbon emissions. The county board should promote the availability of credits and rebates and enhance the green building incentive policy to provide attractive incentives for achieving these goals. The plan's vision for transportation falls short in promoting transit and micromobility options that will conveniently connect the corridor to nearby neighborhoods as well as other parts of Arlington in the region. The plan should call for an update of the master transportation plan to reflect this vision. As noted in the plan, climate mitigation is necessary, 
To that end, more discussion is warranted on reducing urban heat island impacts of future development. The recent adoption of targets of 35% tree canopy coverage in the core area is positive, but the plan should include, should identify uh, the zoning requirements necessary to ensure that the space will actually be available. This plan should be aspirational and reflecting a clear vision for a prosperous Langston Boulevard community that addresses the climate crisis and offers a roadmap for county policies, investments, and engagement with developers to achieve this vision, setting the example for development across Arlington. Sandy Chess Brown is followed by Paul Holland. Good evening. I am here as the president of the Waverly Hills Civic Association and the vice chair of Plan Lakes and Boulevard Community Forum. First, I wanna thank the county staff, especially Natasha for her extraordinary professionalism and patience, and Jen and many others in the county for 10 years of stakeholder engagement. Quarter wide, I would like to recommend adoption of the plan and please support the following not currently in the plan. Plan Langston Boulevard is based on environmental resilience. Climate change is the defining narrative of our time. Please put teeth in it. In 2024, create a green Main Street checklist to be used at site plan review. Public open space, the plan does not include any. Please support acquisition of land and ensure that the privately owned public space are actually publicly accessible. Area one. Support updating the East Falls Church Plan in 2024. Support hundreds of affordable housing units in an appropriate location near the Metro. Increase both housing and Metro ridership. Area two, support a staff-led community engagement process in 2023-24 to discuss the three community centers and the Gray House at Fire Station 8 and especially the endangered LAC. Include preservation of the historic school as an option for discussion. Support black heritage and culture and support the arts and community meeting spaces. Area three, including Waverly Hills. Follow the plan's logic and support medium height buildings on the five sites in Waverly Hills. Waverly Hills is the only planned area not close to Metro that is targeted for 10 stories. Encourage seven to eight stories similar to APA's current construction at the Boston Metro. Preserve affordable marks until those sites redevelop with CAFs and preserve lobbying the legislature to increase the negotiated percentage at site plan review from three and a half to 5% to 10% CAFs. Support county investment now in stormwater management along Albemarle and 20th Street. Support transit equity, including reduce bus headways to 10 minutes, signal priority and riders comfort with sheltering bus stops. Provision zero, support more and safer traffic lights and crosswalks and work with VDOT to limit the speed limit to 25 miles per hour. Lastly, Arlington is currently a retail desert protect the boulevard's vibrant businesses, provide each charging stations and sufficient parking for all of our current retail and services, including five grocery stores and many small businesses important to all of North Arlington. Thank you. Paul Holland is followed by Ginger Brown. Good evening, Chair Patel and Planning Commission members. My name is Paul Holland. And I serve as the chair of the Plan Lakes and Boulevard Community Forum. Um, I'm pleased to come to you before you tonight and express my strong support for the plan and also recommend three specific areas of improvement and two general observations for your consideration. I'll summarize these briefly in my remarks. However, the details, including specific tax recommendations, can be found in the letter I submitted to you and the county board. The three specific areas include public space, capital improvement planning, and the implementation matrix found in section five. Regarding public space, the plan must ensure that all privately owned public space as called for throughout the plan are open and accessible to the general public. These spaces should function as publicly owned public spaces. Too often privately owned public spaces achieved at the cost of bonus density do not serve the broader community. Often they are designed in such a way that both limit access to the public and do not address the concerns of the community 
that are raised during the public design process. Additionally, the county should designate and actively pursue opportunities for parkland acquisition in accordance with Appendix 2 of the 2019 Public Spaces Master Plan. These land acquisition opportunities include parcels associated with existing parks or parcels that offer the opportunity to create a new park of at least a quarter acre. Regarding the CIP, as a planned area, Lincoln Boulevard will require investment through the 10-year CIP to ensure that the vision outlined in the plan is realized. Successful imp implementation of the plan must not rely solely on private investment achieved through bonus density to support a broad range of public improvements. Regarding the implementation matrix, the current implementation, implementation matrix included in Section 5 of the document fails to meet the information and clarity standards set by the county board when they approved the rosin sector plan in 2015. I know some of you all have worked on that plan and, and I think it very much reflected the will of the community, the interest of the community and had three columns, including the county mechanism. So what was the funding mechanism, potential funding source, as well as whether redevelopment was needed to complete the action that was called for uh, or was recommended. This change will provide clarity and ease of future interpretation and implementation. Finally, two ob additional observations. I strongly believe that Arlington does not ask enough of the development community during the, re during the redevelopment process. Arlington is a premier location to own and develop property. Legacy landowners will re realize tremendous profits as a result of this, this plan, and the county staff and the county board should ask more of the development community in the future. As we move forward, let's be bold and outline a strategic vision for development in our county, one that achieves a consensus for future land use and building height while embracing future changes. Thank you. Our last speaker is Ginger Brown. Hi, I'm Ginger Brown. I'm the executive director of the Linkston Boulevard Alliance. Uh, the community's vision going back to the beginning of the grassroots effort in 2012 is to create equitable, inclusive, walkable, community-serving commercial hubs that support small businesses and create a sense of place. This plan does that, and we are looking forward to adopting it. But today, we offer a few more ref refinements for your consideration that will improve the plan and increase the community support for the plan in the final stretch. First, in the interest of time, we'd like to align ourselves with Paul Holland's comments on strengthening language around the CIP investment and expanding publicly owned parkland and with Sandy Chestround on climate change and resiliency and the Chamber on parking and small businesses. Second, we believe the retail maps need some minor changes. An extension of the gold retail designation in Area 3 from Glebe Road on the south side to the Lehigh Shops, as well as the north side one block east, is essential to supporting community-serving commercial hubs. The Lehigh Shops are the heart of the community. The retail maps should be changed to gold to make it clear that this is an important community serving center with restaurants and interior design standards. Third, we believe the buildings identified in the plan for full preservation in the activity hub should be changed to partial preservation. When the buildings are past their useful life, a partial preservation option will be more feasible and economically sound. Fourth, an option for a pedestrian and bicycle connection should be added to the plan behind the Lee Harrison Shopping Center. We align ourselves with the Yorktown Civic Association and the landowner. Finally, the John M. Langston Citizens Association goal to encourage longevity and preservation of the Halls Hill Highview Park as one of the remaining historically Black neighborhoods in Arlington as, a, as the core re revitalizes should be given some consideration. Now, thank you, and let's pass this plan. Thank you. Okay. That is our last public speaker for the evening. Thanks, Madam Clerk. Okay, um, Commissioner Lentelmi, transportation. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, this was an agenda item, an action item at the Transportation Commission meeting last Thursday. Unfortunately, we only had six members it present two were another two were remote thus we did not have a quorum thus we could not make motions or vote on any motions nonetheless we did have our discussion on this um we did uh, get we had a colloquy with staff uh that confirmed that the um eminent domain will not be being used to make transportation improvements um we also um confirmed that while the MTP, when changed, would allow for, provides for additional streets um, along Langston Boulevard. 
um, that while staff will be recommending they be used by vehicles as well as pedestrians and bicycles, that the site plan process would ultimately be the process that would decide what the characterization of those streets would be. Um, staff believes that this, because this is an, a high level plan, it should always include all possible modes of transportation for new streets and then have that be decided um, at site plan. Um, we also uh, zeroed in on the 25th Street North potential, um, North, which was the Harris Teeter site. Um, two of us recommended that that be made bicycle and pedestrian only. Um, one commissioner commented for, for vehicles, but again, this was confirmed that the way to deal with this would be at site plan rather than through this plan. Um, overall, the, the tone of the meeting was supportive of Plan Langston Boulevard, but again, we could not vote on it. Um, a second item which is relevant to this was we another action item that we couldn't vote on was the transit strategic plan where we were told that that is going to be recommending a 12 minute headway for the, the 55 bus, art bus, which of course runs up and down Langston Boulevard. Um, the plan is asking for a 10 minute headway ultimately, which certainly we support, um, but they, we also were told by the staff member presenting the uh, transportation strategic plan that um, if demand is there, it can go down to 10 minutes, that um, the TSP saying 12 minutes is not a floor. That's a current recommendation that could be changed as demand has changed. Um, that pretty much sums up the Transportation Commission's um, uh, deliberations last Thursday. Thank you. Did you also want to? Um... Yes, thank you. Um, I will note, as I did at the RTA and also Transportation Commission, that I in addition to being planning commissioner, I'm also serving as president of the Langston Boulevard Alliance. Um, tonight, I will be acting as a planning commissioner and any opinions that I express tonight are not necessarily those of the Langston Boulevard Alliance, though in many ways we align. Um, uh, this also, this is not a conflict according to the, um, the county attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so the matter is now with the commission. Like last time, friends, <laughs> we've identified some areas uh, for discussion. So I'm going to read those areas for um, our consideration. If you believe that something is missing, please let me know. We'll add it as a bucket. For uh, these are kind of mega topics, if you will. Okay. Um, first one: land use, Gallup, ZO, townhouses, Cherrydale, and EFC. Got it. Okay. Number two, housing supply and affordability. Number three, building heights, density, uses. Four, transportation, parking. Five, historic preservation. Six, public spaces. And seven, sustainability. Anything else that we want to add to this list? The, the retail, was that in the list? Retail. We put it can go under uses, I think, but if you that's like, fine. Like, uh, I just want to make sure to, we yep. touch on it. All right. Should we sh start our conversation? Yes. All right. Number one, land use, Gallup, ZO, townhouses, and Cherrydale EFC. Any questions, thoughts, comments? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I noted that staff would, well, they would do want to move up East Falls Church and Cherrydale. They want it to be medium rather than short term. Is that correct, what I read? The reason why I personally would prefer it being kept short term is, are, are two. Um, given my experience with Plan Langston Boulevard, and I was there from the beginning 11 years ago, it took way longer than anyone expected, including staff. From when the board, county board gave the go ahead to do this, it took longer than expected just to get the RFP in place, to get the contractors in place, to get them retained up to speed. Delays kept happening. This ended up running like three, four years longer than anyone had anticipated. And some some good reasons, some not so good reasons, but it, that's what happened. Unless we start moving right away on it, given how long it takes to get this done, 
by doing it medium, you're building in at least another two, three years to what is already a long process. WMATA will want us to have, want, want to, will want a commitment from the county in order for it to pay attention to it. Fairfax has totally redone and rezoned the West Falls Church Station. Um, it's a massive effort that they did, but they stepped up and WMATA paid attention and was a partner on that. For us, for us to say that this is short term and show we're serious on it, that will, I think, incentivize WMATA to step up and put us on their radar to work with around the station there. So it, the sooner we do this, the more likely it is to get for us to raise go up higher in the in WMATA's priorities. So I would strongly urge that we keep this short term. And I know there are all sorts of priorities going on for staff. You know, Planning Commission certainly knows how limited staff is. But we think it's really, I think it's really important that we keep it short term so that we can at least start the process going, given how long it inevitably is going to take. Yeah, I'd like to associate myself with uh, Commissioner Lentelmi's comments as well. I think getting, because really the feeling that that I got was that Cherrydale and East Falls Church are sort of the addendums to Plan Langston Boulevard. And I think a lot of the targets that we're trying to hit uh, with Plan Langston can be addressed, at least in some capacity, particularly the affordable housing. Um, there's a lot of residential land in both of those areas. Uh, so I think that there's a lot that we can do to supplement what we're doing here. And so again, you know, 10 years ago it was a very different world for me. Uh, so I was still a child back then. But <laughs> when all this started, then I think that just highlights the point that this stuff could take a long time. And so I think um, the sooner we get on it, the better. And I think we can really attack some of these other angles, some of these issues from different angles. Commissioner Sarley. I will associate myself with both of the previous commissioners' comments. And uh, while I was not a child when the plan started, um, <laughs> I think, um, you know, there's something that we ought to really pay attention to parking lots next to Metro that just bothers me. You know, I find that morally dubious. <laughs> um, and so I think we really need to capitalize that as soon as possible. Thank you. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you. Um, I was interested in Economic Development Commission's um, recommendation that the county initiate some of the GLUP amendments that would be needed to um, provide greater incentives to owners and stimulate reinvestment. So I was interested in your thoughts on that. Um, do you feel like it's not that that much work for the for the developer to work on? Um, do you feel like we could negotiate other community benefits if we took this if we relieved them from this responsibility? So what are your thoughts on that? Does the commission want me to answer it now or continue comments? Should I go ahead? Yeah. So in response to that, um, staff feels pretty strongly that if the county were to initiate the GLUP amendments uh, proactively and do it ahead of any site plan application, that it would actually limit what we can negotiate and leverage from the increased density in terms of affordable housing and, and potentially many other benefits and, you know, in terms of community benefits. Um, so we recommend against it. It's definitely more helpful for the developers, but it just reduces our, our leverage. If you were not seeing the development that you wanted and were hoping for um, in this area, would you reconsider that position? Absolutely. Um, there's always an opportunity to come back and revisit something in the plan. If, it, if a year from now we feel that the tools aren't delivering what we were hoping it would, Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so I think we're ready to move on to the second topic. Housing's, nope, we are not. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Rookie, thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I'll briefly associate myself with the comments um, about East Falls Church in Cherrydale. Uh, I do have a question though, with regards to Ms. Zimmerman's comments about um, the proposed GLUP changes for areas um, two and three. Um, she said that doing so would be lawful and that that has been communicated to county staff. Uh, Natasha or anyone else, can you please speak to that? Sure, I'm sorry, I got, I was hearing something else. Could you repeat the last part that you said? 
Sure. It's it's Miss it's Miss Zimmerman's um, assertion yes. that uh, her and others have communicated to county staff about the legality of the glut changes in areas two and three. Sure. So I know we have Kelly on the line. I believe she's joining us virtually, and she can answer more specifically um, what the implications are with 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 the glut changes. But again, I just want to remind everyone that this is a a the Langston Boulevard plan is a plan under the comprehensive plan. It's, it's still a policy. We are not rezoning any properties as a result of this. And as we just explained, we're not necessarily, we're not going out there and changing the GLUP proactively. So this is still an optional tool. Uh, property owners can do, can use the tool if they wish, or they can uh, build according to by right development regulations. And again, it's still a choice. Sure, I'll, I'll just add that we were reviewing um, Ms. Zimmerman's testimony, and um, I, I think first we wanted to clarify that the the activity hub that's been identified as the Moore's um, Langston Civic Association activity hub, that has always been part of the plan. It's always been included as a recommended activity hub. Um, I think some of the concern was about um, perhaps something that is um, included in the restrictive covenants of the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, that's not something that the county can really speak to. Um, you know, our responsibility is related to uh, implementing and enforcing the zoning ordinance specifically and developing new land use policy. Um, and so the the extent of the GLOP amendments that are being recommended through um, this land use plan is really the creation of the Langston Boulevard Planning District, which identifies tools that um, that could be used by property owners interested in reinvestment. But as Natasha said, we are not actively uh, seeking to rezone any property uh, through through this effort. Mr. Berkey, did you have any additional follow up or it, does that answer your question? No, no, that was it. I just wanted to I wanted to make sure that it was clear record that that was the case and that was that wasn't already my understanding. But since the assertion was made, I, I wanted to make sure that we were um, an understanding that, in, in fact, there's not really a legal issue here. It is a policy choice that the board can can make. And obviously, uh, property owners can go ahead and exercise their rights if they choose to do so. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Lentami. Um, I have a question uh, for land use. Do we consider that the retail questions part of land use or is that for a later bucket? The next one, okay. It's two, it's two down. Okay, that's fine. Okay, now we can move on to the second topic, housing supply and affordability. Any questions on housing supply and affordability? Okay. Oh, Commissioner Steiner. Well, I, I figure since there was so much comment tonight, um, you know, and, and the comment we we ourselves made last time around that there's there's that goal that was in the affordable housing master plan back in 2015 of 2,500 by 2040, and I'm curious, like there seems to be like an overwhelming sentiment. That we need more affordable units. Is there any reason why those haven't been worked into the plan at this point to meet that to meet that goal? Sure. So I know that Joel Franklin is is online, and he could speak to um, how that projection was was sort of determined in 2015 in terms of your question about the plan and and why we haven't necessarily met that target or goal some people think it's a target and a goal and we've explained that it's a projection right based on on what we think the need for affordable housing units is countywide and then from that there was a, a proportional share right for langston um it, it's really based on the development capacity mm -hmm. we've done extensive analysis of every uh, imaginable uh, development uh, site and uh, you know consolidation of properties and all of that along the corridor to see which sites are, are have feasible development mm -hmm. and at the end of the day the building envelope is the building envelope and it is what we can fit right. yeah gotcha thank you yeah yeah i figure at least it would be cathartic for everyone here tonight to sort of like hear the rationale to hear that it. sure yeah okay Thanks. thank you
So, uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Peterson and then Commissioner Bagley. Okay. Um, this isn't so much for tonight, um, but I just wanted to bring up the idea of possibly instead of talking about the number of units provided, possibly consider the number of people that can be housed through affordable housing plans, because a lot of our housing affordable housing plans don't provide family size units and you could fit a family of five in 900 square feet if you have a three bedroom or if you build that as a studio or a one bedroom you're fitting one or two people so i think i i really hear the community talking about providing more density and i would also like to make sure that density includes families because sometimes more humans can live in affordable housing if you provide family units so again we can't do anything for that tonight but in the future, I think our, our affordable housing considerations can include um, family size units and the number of people housed. Thank you. Can I piggyback this to the next topic? To the next topic, yep. Okay, well, let's let Commissioner Berkey go so then you can make the transition to the next thank one. You. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Berkey? Thank you again. Um, not a uh, question, more of a comment. Again, I. I really want to applaud um, staff here um, for for doing a thorough analysis here. And, and Joel Franklin, I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to, good to hear from you. See you. Um, you know, I just I still think that I think this plan goes about as far as it can reasonably expect to go because of what Natasha said with regards to the building um, envelopes um, in our available tools. And it just rem it, it still strikes me that. Um, we pretty much are going to do what we can with the current tools, and I know that staff and the board have expressed interest in maybe, you know, reopening up the affordable housing master plan and, and doing a review like that. It just still strikes me that 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 the commission may want to express its sentiment um, that you know the county should aggressively do so, especially with regards to Langston Boulevard here. Um, we've just kind of plucked all the low hanging fruit, and so. We need to be, in my opinion, more aggressive and maybe providing more opportunities for our affordable housing developer partners to maybe pursue some of the properties on the quarter that they don't currently hold or don't maybe are not publicly held. Uh, they can maybe actually compete within the um, real estate market. So that's my my overall comment. I'm not sure what that looks like, but um, I would I would be interested in seeing other folks um, comments or, or at least you know pushing for for some type of sentiment that way. Uh, thank you. Um, I think, well, I, I'll just say I want to align with Commissioner Berkey's comments, but I also, I think, um, am, am struggling with if we're not looking at additional tools or we're not looking at um, maybe a little bit more innovative ways to think beyond what we're able to think beyond, going back to our conversation about um, not just looking at 60%, right? And so, you know, we had that lovely conversation at the RTA about what that ultimately means when we're not looking at 60%, when we're looking at 30%, and then, you know, we're having the numbers. Um, but, you know, this, when when you um, said about the building envelope and what, what we are able to do, um, I, I just wonder if, as Commissioner Berkey's saying, I just wonder if there's other ways um, that we can be thinking about this moving forward to expand our options. Um, especially if if we all know and agree that we need to be looking at ways to increase our numbers um, at 30%. So if if that means that we're having some of our numbers by by nature of math, then we have to look beyond um, some of our current options and be visionary in that space around how to increase the options. And I know Commissioner Guerin would like to speak on this topic too. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to align myself with Commissioner Berkey's comments. And um, while I know that we're not talking about additional tools right now, right here with regard to this plan, I think we always need to be looking at more creative ways to provide more housing in our community, more housing overall, more affordable housing. Um, and I, I agree with Mr. Holland's comments that we don't always ask enough of our developers. I, I hope that we're going to be looking at how we can get some more units on site as part of our developments. I think we also want to be looking at tools that don't require us to outlay money like location efficient mortgages that our developers can help us achieve. So I'd like to 
maybe shift this conversation so that we ask the entire community to help us come up with creative ways to achieve this goal. The developers, voice, everyone who's here in support of this plan, I feel we haven't fully exhausted that. And I know we're not doing that specifically as part of this plan, but that 2,500 units is what we need right now today. We are gonna need more as soon as we get that 2,500 units. Thanks. Commissioner Bagger. Yeah, I wanna align myself with both Commissioner Berkey and Commissioner Guerin, um, which is where I wanted to go. Um, as we sit here as a commission and struggle, when we get development after development after development, and m many of them come in with no affordable housing on site. And yes, there is a uh, an important role for the um, fund, obviously. So that's a you know cash contribution, but it, it just seems to me, and, and I know you have a lion's share of this. Is an amazing project that you've taken on, and uh, a lot of time and thought. But I think as Commissioner Guerin said, we really have to be thinking outside the box here. We're going to wind up just like we have in the RB corridor where we have the heights, but we just don't have the affordability. And that's not what we want. I think you hear it from all sides here. So we we this gives us an opportunity because this is a newer frontier, so to speak, um, to really do something creative here. But uh, and I don't necessarily say that it has to be per se in the plan, but we really need to be as a community thinking about this so we don't mess this up. So thank you. Commissioner Sarley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to associate myself with Commissioner Peterson's comments. I think um, the definition of affordable and, you know, I know Commissioner Berkey um, comes from the Housing Commission and he could probably um, elucidate this a little bit, but I think the notion of affordable studios versus affordable three bedrooms is is a significant um, number, right? It's a significant impact, um, even if the units are small, um, which is not a bad thing for a materialistic society. Um, you know, the, the notion of three bedrooms is really important for a family and that creates opportunities for not just single, you know, um, occupancy residences. So thank you. Commissioner Guevara. Hi, I just uh, want to thank staff for all the hard work on this plan. It's come a long way, but I also want to associate myself with the comments from previous commissioners regarding affordable housing. Um, you know, looking at the plan, it says that anything below 50% AMI that's going to be either subsidized through a county or vouchers, and it just seems like there's going to be a huge strain on the county where we can be working harder with developers to make sure that um, affordable units are placed on site and not, they're not just providing the minimum contribution. If it were up to me, if there were, um, they would have to double their contribution if they don't have anything on site. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to also just uh, say how important all these issues are um, for the corridor. So I think, you know, we've been this particular um, term <laughs> has been really heavily focused on a cultural shift where we are looking at um, asking developers in particular to contribute more, do more, and, and shift the culture of how we're able to online more affordable and in particular more units that families can can utilize in Arlington. All right, I think we could go on to the next uh, topic, building heights, density, and uses. I have a clarifying question, and this has to go with the comments that we heard about heights of buildings related to use of solar panels. Can you say more about that? Thank you. Sorry, as I was sneezing. God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it really depends on the location of the building, right? And whether it's south or north. And, and certainly there are concerns if your house is north of a building that is going to be taller. Yeah. Um and that could cast shadows and you know and and obviously reduce the the effectiveness of the solar panels. Um there are a lot of things that this plan won't be able to foresee and 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 let's say control or regulate, but there is this there is an opportunity through the site plan process for any community member that that feels affected by this process by the project that's coming in to be able to raise those concerns. I know that's not the best answer, but 
usually the planning commission yourselves um, have the opportunity to look at those details, right? When when a project comes in, when you can influence just a staff does at a very specific for a very specific project, um, they look at the best orientation of the building, um, the massing, the length of the building, all of that in order to be able to make something that a little bit better that that can be more context sensitive. That is um, very helpful and a good reminder of how this effort fits in with our overall work as a visionary planning document. Any changes will still go through site plan review and have that local commentary. Thank you. Commissioner Berkey. Mr. Berkey, did you want to? Um, I think I I may have missed you on the housing one. No, I don't. I don't, I don't uh, have a comment at this. I no, I okay. don't have a comment at this point. Thanks. Thank you. This is retail, Commissioner Lantel. Okay, retail. Um, we've heard from one commenter, and I also wanted to raise uh, about um, the Lee Heights site having being um, retail priority blue. Um, I did read through the staff report on that, and I did not particularly find the reasoning for it to remain blue to be persuasive to me. Um, we have gold uh, designation at, at Glebe and Langston, and that's appropriate. Um, the Lee Heights site is in many ways just as strong or even stronger a retail node than the couple blocks to the west. Um, so I think that it would be really important that we continue that gold all the way over to Lee Heights in order to make sure that should that site redevelop, that we keep that use in place and it not devolve down to something like a like a you know the gym for the apartment building or or the, the leasing office. Um, you know we want to make sure that that site when it gets built out will always have the option of a restaurant there or other food uses in addition to the other retail that we have there. It is a very strong um, retail site that the not just the community, but the corridor itself goes to all the time. And I think it's it's worth preserving. And I think the way to do that is by having that be designated gold. Um, I will be making a motion at the end that that be done. Um, I just want to make people aware that that'll be coming up. Um, so uh, thank you. Anyone else on this uh, building heights density and uses? Okay, um, Commissioner Berkey. We'd just like to associate myself with Commissioner Lentelmi's comments and say that I would happily support such a, a motion. I understand the staff recommendation and rationale, and I think this is sort of why maybe, maybe several of us joined the Planning Commission. It is sort of a balancing of interests. And on Monday night, when we learned about the commercial markets, um, you know, the, the, the work of um, economic development as far as office buildings and all the things that we need to do in Arlington. You know, we talked a lot about flexibility and, and thinking about that, but as Commissioner Ellen told me was alluding to, you know, there are, are also areas like that shopping center where we do want to preserve that sense of walkability for certain types of retail spaces. And, and to me, that seems like one of those areas that we do probably want to be a little bit more prescriptive. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Weir. I... <clears throat> I'm not yet sure where I stand on this motion, and I am leaning toward probably opposing it. Um, well, th this hypothetical motion. Uh, um, my my concern here has to do with a couple of things. One, we would be talking about the retail level that would apply to new construction, right? And new construction is hella expensive. Uh, that's a technical term that can go into minutes. Um, uh, and it's and it's often restricted by uh, agreements contained within the financing documents uh, and and is um, uh, you know we it, it is often inconsistent with this with these lofty ideas we have about preserving the existing units I mean I can think of more than one restaurant that uh, or 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 um, business that I am am going to go to the mattresses another technical term uh, to support when when their current buildings, um, come up, but but I but I don't think that their current you know I, I, if if they were to relocate I 
I don't think they would be. Re, I don't think businesses can relocate back to the building after after redevelopment. And I am extremely mindful of the presentation that we received uh, on on Monday, and I am extremely wary of of um, uh, recommending more restrictive use conditions for for retail and retail equivalents uh, in in the current environment. So I. I don't know where I stand yet. I, I, um, I, I'm sure we'll have a more fulsome conversation or a fuller conversation when we get to motions, but I, I just wanted to share some of my concerns before we went off the topic. I just want to make sure that I understand the current environment can change. This is a 30, 30 plus year plan. Mm -hmm. So even if it's today, it isn't viable. Well, that, we're talking about down the road. Anyway, that's that a fair point, but my libertarian instincts, you know, I think apply going forward generally, right? Um, not, not just you know, uh, not just in the current environment, but but you're right. Commissioner Strainer. Yeah, I would like to associate myself with uh, Commissioner Lantelmi. I love gyms. I'm in them quite a bit, but they don't need to be everywhere. Uh, so I I think the the spirit from what I've gathered on Plan Langston is that we're we want to preserve what works here, and this is something that works. It's retail. It's walkable. It's a variety of different you know, shops and restaurants that, that people in the community have used or using now. And if, you know, this goes through, we'll continue to use. So, you know, we want to, like, like uh, Commissioner Berkey said, we want to balance these interests that are at play here. And I think that that's something that's worth, um, you know, preserving. Commissioner Peterson. I just wanted to align myself with Commissioner Weir, just raising the point that there is going to be gold right next to this blue area. And so we'll have all the restaurants right there and all the retail there. So there could be too much restaurants. I think having blue, you can still put restaurants in blue. It's just if somebody says, look, I've done some analysis and we've already got five restaurants a block away. So I need the gym here because we don't have one nearby. Like I'm comfortable with that being an option. Especially since, and, and you know, if I may. No, we have. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll take that as a retroactive blessing. Uh, especially since, probabilistically, um, that those those the the sites at that inter intersection where it's gold will go first. Will go before the the highly profitable and successful paid off building. I'm not saying, and we shouldn't shouldn't rely on that in any more than a probabilistic manner, but they would be whatever's built being built there would be competing against whatever probably whatever has already opened. He can do it, maybe I can too. Sure. <laughs> but we're not looking at the specific stores here preserving. You're right, because when it redevelops, it does change. But as commissioners Berkey and Steiner said, it's the concept there and the walkability and creating the neighborhood amenity and being able to keep that idea in place, not, and I agree, not necessarily the existing stores, because as I said, you're absolutely right. When it redevelops, the odds of that same entity being back there generally aren't that high, but the uses themselves, that type of use, that type of neighborhood use, that walkability is something that's worth preserving. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on to transportation and parking. Any comments, questions? Um, yeah, parking. Um, I want to commend staff for being more flexible on parking and recognizing that um, in the years to come, that because we don't have a subway here, this is going to remain to a certain extent auto dependent. We'll try to minimize the need to use a car, but the fact is cars will be needed for a large percentage of the of the potential customers up and down this corridor and the new residents that come there. Um, so if anything, I'd like, I would have loved to even see a little more about the possibility of public private partnerships for parking structures, um, having something like the way we have in Shirlington. Um, you know, we have that in the county now, um, but definitely the, the need is there for parking for those existing, for the existing and to be retailers. We don't want to repeat the errors that we've made in Columbia Pike, where we do have vacancies because they can't park it. And for that matter, we even in Cherrydale, we have a couple of one building where it is very hard to lease the retail there because of 
the parking isn't obvious or it isn't enough. Um, we have to learn from our mistakes on that. And I don't want to make sure, want to make sure we don't repeat those mistakes with this plan. And again, thank you for recognizing that parking is going to be necessary going forward. Um, even for the current uses, the by right uses, that if they can have more flexibility on parking, that will help keep our retailers vibrant, our existing retailers vibrant. Thank you. Commissioner Sarley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so on transportation, I want to start by saying that bus shelters should be a minimum, like every single bus stop anywhere in the county should have a shelter. Um, and this is part and parcel of the affordability um, goal that we have. Um, sure, we can have affordable housing, which that's a very well sort of represented topic on this commission and other commissions. But I think then we have to think of the trickle down effects. We were talking about parking yesterday and affordability to that, um, access to groceries, access to you know other things that people need to have to live. Um, and one of them is transportation and of course, given the parking conversation we're having, I think, you know, making both bus and public transportation both um, affordable, but um, attractive is the word I'm looking for, so that people don't feel intimidated by standing on the sun or in the rain waiting for the bus. And of course, I will also put a plug in for shorter lead times between the bus, because I think Langston Boulevard is sort of a no-brainer to get to Metro. You can go one way or the other, whatever's closer, and that could be a really viable public transportation without committing to Metro. So I think the, the first step is for us as a community to invest on the attractiveness and the viability of public transportation. Thank you. So I will associate myself with um, Commissioner Sarley in the uh, two comments that he made about the bus shelters. Was that I recorded? Think, I think so. Two day, two this November goes down <laughs> in history. Um, <laughs> so bus shelters, certainly at a minimum. And um, I, and I really appreciate the fact that you raised the uh, rain and heat because, you know, as we know, when we're thinking about two of the most, um, the places where we are most vulnerable in Arlington with regard to climate is is flooding and heat. Um, so we want to make sure that these these opportunities are available for everybody. Um, but I also wanted to say, and I'm glad you raised this parking, because we had a lot of conversation on Monday with our friends about the um, <laughs> performance parking pilot. <laughs> and um, I know myself, I had a lot of comments. You missed it, Commissioner Gavada. I had a lot of comments <laughs> about about the parking issue. And and quite frankly, you know, there's this grant. You know, the county is working with God on on, um, but that grant was limited just to the metro corridors, and it. Um, it you know it, it's not something that would be available or it's not presently available for us to understand um, what our parking needs and availability are along the the this particular corridor. So I just would hope that as we continue to move forward with that pilot and and whatever the grant requirements are, that there's opportunities that we're looking for expansion of that because I don't necessarily know. I know Commissioner Lynn Tell me has said this over and over again. You know, we, we talk, we use the word flexibility in with regard to parking here, but I think we would want to have data that really helps us better appreciate and understand what that flexibility needs to look like and where it needs to, where we need to achieve it to ensure that, um, that our retail spaces have what they need to continue to attract uh, people to those spaces. And I think Commissioner Peterson and then Commissioner Guerin. Thank you. Um, I had a couple questions. Um, one, the first one about parking. Um, I'm trying to understand or think through how um, the parking situation and shared parking is going to work during the SPRC process. Um, if an applicant comes and says, you know, I want to build twice as much parking as is required by the county, usually we would say, no, you're overparked. Don't do that. That's awful. But if they're saying, well, no, hold on, I'm planning on letting others, people who develop in the future, use this shared space. So how is that negotiation going to happen if they're the first property redeveloping and wants to put in a ton of parking spaces? Um, so that's my first question. So staff's intention on these shared parking agreements is not an over provision of parking. It's making sure that the parking that's built is well utilized and that it's not just for 
the building that it is being associated with. So those shared parking agreements are really more, and if someone does want to build a little extra and do that, we can work that at the time. But staff's intent with that is really to make sure that when we're developing these sites, that is not just for the building, the parking happens to be associated with, or development happens to be associated with, but that it serves the surrounding area as well. So as you have developments come in, there's more of a parking availability because you might have slightly different uses. You park once, you walk other places. We really don't want to create just the, I have my 222 parking spaces for the 350 units that happen to be in my building and the retail that's associated with it. But it's also available if you park here and go grocery shopping and then eat across the street. A lot of times right now, that is not something that buildings will allow you to do or a parking garage will allow you to do. So that is really the intent behind these shared parking agreements that we want to do is to break down those barriers between your ability to park somewhere and walk somewhere else like we do experience in other parts of the county. Sometimes it comes with a mild pay to park situation, but those type of opportunities so that you park once and go around. Not that you provide extreme amounts of parking with any one development, but that parking that's provided is well utilized and taken advantage of by the people visiting the corridor. So none of these parking areas are going to have the like, you will be towed if you leave this premises, like is everywhere else. <laughs> it's the intent. Okay. Excuse um, me for a moment. Could you please introduce yourself for the record? Oh, my apologies, Kristen Calkins, DES Transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and what, during the SPRC process, do you envision that you would allow more parking in places like a grocery store that might be the magnet for someone to go to the area first and then, oh, well, I'm here. Let me just walk over. I couldn't find the meat that I needed at the grocery store. There's a, a butcher across the street with specialty. Let me head over there. Oh, now it's later than I was expected, so I'm going to run over to the restaurant and grab some takeout. Um, so do you envision that that some places are going to be allowed to have more parking than would otherwise be? I think it will be a case by case basis and context based along the corridor. OK. OK, so for something for us to consider during the SPRC process. Um, my second question was just about the protected bike lanes. Um, I would definitely be interested in seeing that defined in the plan. Um, I think that there is a gendered aspect to this as women are more likely to use biking as a transportation if there's a higher bar to safety. Um, families taking their children biking or, or riding one of those electric bikes with the huge cargoes on the back and their kids are back there. I think people are more likely to for this to continue to be a really fair family oriented place and have families riding on bikes if we have protected bike lanes. We did define it. So we defined enhanced bike facilities as low stress facilities for bicyclists that provide protection and or separation from vehicular traffic, such as buffered bike lanes and protected bike facilities. Okay, great. Um, and my last question um, was just about, uh, we got some emails and you guys have already addressed this about the 25th road North and having that, uh, that transportation, the street cut across. Um, so I know this is something that we would actually handle during the SPRC process. So we don't necessarily need to define it now, but, um, when you were looking at introducing new roads like this, do you have in your mind, um, and if I can remember the pronunciation, the woonerfs that we had, that we discussed a few years ago, is that something that you guys are thinking about for the introduction of these new streets that are kind of like these little side streets, um, making sure they are very pedestrian oriented, more so than, than regular. Um, I can see why you would include the road here, but I also can appreciate the neighbor's perspective of this being a quiet little road and then suddenly there's gonna be cut through traffic, but if it's a, a woonerf sort of design, that may make them feel more comfortable. Again, something that will be looked at and understood through the site plan process about what these different connections need to look like, what they're serving, what they're connecting. And it also comes along with what's being built. So the flexibility to have that conversation at site plan is really important. Commissioner Bagley. I know this came up during the RTA, but um, in your opinion, do you believe that VDOT is going to be amenable to possibly taking out lanes of a major arterial that carries a lot of traffic that isn't local. It's coming from other places because it is one of the few places now you bail off of the tolls. Um, the other arterials have more stops. This one you can accelerate to great speeds on. So 
is VDOT going to be amenable to this? And, and the reason I ask, as I mentioned the last time, I've been managing a business at the corner of Old Dominion and Langston for nine plus years. I've been rear-ended once at a, a, a red light. Um, I can't imagine being a bicyclist out there. It's just too scary. Um, speed limits seem to be questionable in some spots. Uh, my car reads something different than what I see sometimes actually in the signage. So by obviously if we took, if we made it more pedestrian friendly and maybe minimize that, but I guess that's all tangential on whether how much they're going to respond to this, correct? So one of the new actions in the plan is to do a detailed analysis of the corridor from Veach to Spout Run <laughs> to look at what it would take to reduce the travel lanes from six to four. The high-level transportation analysis that was done as part of this plan shows that we have the capacity to do that, that there's the ability to process the throughput of vehicles as well as really changing the corridor and making it comfortable to walk on and comfortable to bike on. It will actually help slow speeds because you won't have an excess of travel lanes. And one of the reasons we have speeding is we have excess roadway capacity. You don't speed when it's congested. You speed when there's a lot of space to maneuver. So one of the reasons we put that action is there to acknowledge that we do need to coordinate with VDOT in the future. They haven't said no. VDOT's position is typically like do the analysis and show it'll show us it will work. Yes, let's hope that they cooperate. Thank you. Um, Okay, hold on one second. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also, I, I, I was just saying this to um, Commissioner Weir under my breath, but maybe you heard. Um, I want to also think about sometimes we we don't always, we think about things kind of one dimensionally sometimes in the ways that we, we identify kind of like something as bike friendly or something as pedestrian friendly or something, you know. I also become a little bit concerned because our neighborhoods some of the conversations that we talk about here when we were um, in our different iterations of discussions this year is how we want to promote diversity, how we want to promote access, how we want to make sure that people don't feel excluded. And so, you know, in these discussions about even something as simple as transportation, um, you know, if you make it more difficult for a person to get from one place to another, they will no longer go there. Right. And and when we have homogenous neighborhoods, we don't want that outcome where people are not experiencing the beauty and the opportunities of other neighborhoods across our wonderful community. So I think that when we're thinking about some of these things, we need to make sure that we are also considering the community person's experience about how they are getting from one place to another, and are we making that opportunity something that welcomes not just um, our understanding of what an Arlingtonian may look like or, or experience or what we want to see in behavioral changes, but also like what it functionally means for a person who is going with a older um, Arlingtonian or individual, a younger person, right? A person who may need assistance in moving about, right? Like we just need to be thinking about all experiences. And so I think that we in this planning commission often talk about trying to think about ways to reduce um, speed or vehicle traffic or, you know, make things a little bit safer for pedestrians or, you know, but we need to be really thinking about it all together because we are really supposed to be sharing these spaces. Okay. Commissioner Lentelli. Um all that is true, uh, but I also want to make sure that we understand for the six lanes that we're talking about that go from Roslyn to to I-66. Um, as Ms. Culkin said, VDOT would require a lot of studies. I mean, that, that just is a given. You know, we can't get around that. We don't want to get around that. But VDOT is, has demonstrated that it's open to it because it has, in fact, narrowed part of that road already. It has narrowed from the Key Bridge past the Marriott site from three lanes to two and added the, the, the bike and pedestrian facility there. So it shows that VDOT is amenable to it when the data allows. Um, that has not caused any backups. It has not caused a problem going westbound. Uh, so it is a viable 
um, option for us to keep it in this plan to think about that very, very wide right of way. Because it isn't just six lanes, but it's six wide lanes um, and two narrow sidewalks. Um, so it's it's worth looking at. And it is appropriate that it be in this plan. And absolutely, VDOT has to be in that because it is their road. Um, but they have demonstrated their willingness to look at it and be open-minded and to change it. So I think it's, you know, we're, we're in the right place in recommending what we are for this. Um, Commissioner Sarley, Commissioner Weir. Um, I'd like to take it, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to take it back to Commissioner Peterson's comments on um, sort of seeking orientation on the SPRC process and the parking, the shared parking. And um, being sort of on the business end of some of these plans, um, I'm always curious. So like, for instance, I think it's, and I know this is going to be a case by case situation, so I hear that, but I think having a game plan or at least some sort of possible outlines for how to implement shared parking is um, probably a wise thing for us to think about. And the, the, the thought that occurred to me was like, if the delivery of development comes in such a way that we have a historic structure that we want to preserve, it doesn't have adequate parking, um, but then we have an IOU on the across the street development that would then incorporate, you know, we have to have a little bit of a game plan, a little bit of language for us to help um, sort of both assuage any um, nervousness from the from the community about this development or this improvement, you know, and then the future parking promise. And, and the I think what makes sense there is to prevent, you know, to make sure that we can keep any development that comes up, you know, moving. Um, and not have it stop because we don't have the appropriate or adequate or future coming parking uh, structure. So that was just like a contingency that I thought about that I think perhaps um, the case by case might not be quite adequate, just a little bit of a sort of thinking on the back of the napkin. Thank you. Um, changing the topic ever so slightly, uh, for anyone who's got got it open, um, I want to direct people's attention to page, I think, 84. Um, there is some language on enhanced bicycling facilities. Uh, this is not 84 of the PDF. This is page 84, as in um, the, the page that has 84 on the as, as the marker. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, the the box definition for enhanced bicycle facilities, um, I, I just th this is a this might be you might say that my thinking here is is overly editorial, but in Arlington we have a really fantastic. Uh, I think that a lot of people would call it very. A lot of a lot of the the transit folks would agree that it's 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 very highly consistent with best practices appendix on design guidelines for enhanced bicycle facilities, um, and I am considering a, a motion to recommend that um, that that box uh, be. Amended to 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 include language uh, to the effect of consistent with Appendix C of the bicycle element of the master transportation transportation plan. I think that um, it it's both uh, it's it's both it'll be both good to um, include that that reference language and um, should you know uh, a, a member of the public get to page eighty four of the uh, uh, of of this plan, it would be great to to have. Uh, a way of ever so subtly um, flagging that document for their attention. All right, historic preservation. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I have a question for staff on that. Um, it's something we've been talking about for quite a long time, <laughs> uh, historic preservation, and uh, we now have a new um, historic preservation plan that um, that's going before the board also. Um, what is the difference? It was different. Um, when there is full preservation for a building, and you know, we heard one of the commenters here ask about that, does that mean that the building has to stay as is exactly as is? Does it mean exterior only, but not the interior? Um, how much exterior can be changed? Can the dimensions be changed? Can it go up higher by keeping the facade in place? Um, I'm not sure, um, and I, I, I'm absolutely sorry to say, I'm, I should know this, I suppose, uh, after all this time we've been working on this. Um, 
you know, how does that work, number one? And number two, this plan is recommending, but a number of the sites that we're recommending actually aren't on the inventory at this point, which I think means they would have to go through the county process that they may or may not make it given what the county criteria are for historic preservation or making it onto the various levels of the inventory. Can you go into that a little bit or discuss how that works? Sure. So let me take the first question first, and then we'll talk about the other one just to clarify what you meant. Um, so again, the plan's recommendations for preservation, they're aspirational. Again, they were the recommendations were based on a very ex sort of detailed analysis of each one of the sites, but it didn't do an architectural one thing I will I will say is that we did not go out there and do an architectural review of each one of these buildings. Um, the analysis, while it was detailed, it really just focused on the seven points, the seven criteria or factors that we that we listed there. And one of them was um, the HRI designation. So having said that, it's it's really aspirational in nature. we 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 talked about the fact that there are very few of a lot of these sort of, resources of, of, of certain time periods along the corridor. They're they're far and few, you know, in between. And the goal is to try to preserve as many as we can. So while that is a, a recommendation and an aspiration at the time of site plan review, staff will look at that as well as all of the additional goals that perhaps that particular site might be asked uh, to help achieve. Um, certainly the site that the property owner was mentioning earlier is not the only site that has multiple goals that are being assigned, you know, per the plan. So all of those things will be put in a balance. And so it's, it is not a, a designation. We're just simply saying it's a, it's a, it's a recommendation to be for it to be considered in the future, along with any other um, potential opportunities that that site can, can deliver through the new development. So even if it says full preservation, and I believe the plan says this, um, it doesn't preclude the opportunity for partial preservation or even no preservation. At the end of the day, it is up to the property owner to decide what they want to do. And we hope to be able to, you know, to talk through different opportunities or possibilities. But this okay. doesn't just say that it's the only option for that site. That's good to know. And if it's not on the HRI, to get on the HRI, the property owner has to be involved in that. Sure. If, if we can't just take a magic wand, touch it and say it's now on the HRI no, that's at correct. this level. There's right. a much larger process for that to happen, and right. not anybody at this point, process, of, if I remember correctly, has changed, so not anybody can come in and say, I want this, I nominate this for the HRI. No, that's correct. There's a whole process to do that. The county will just assign it. Okay, thank right. you very much. Yes. Commissioner Peterson? Yeah, um, I was interested in um, the public comment about the business owner of Lion Village Apartments asking for partial preservation and just kind of wanted to clarify. So you're recommending, you know, ideal world, full preservation. Um, if the business owner says, no, we don't want to preserve it at all, um, even though it's in the plan, and even though a special GLUP study might say, okay, well, the plan says preservation, um, but you don't want to, I feel like in the special GLUP study, we would say, no, you really got to do it. And then when we got to the SPRC, we'd say, no, you really got to do it. What are you going to do? That, that would be one of the negotiating factors. So I guess at some point, you know, maybe they'll say, fine, we'll, we'll work with you and help you out. So I guess just for the business owner's perspective, this isn't a requirement but you're going to get pressured along the way to do what the plan says. But at the end of the day, you wouldn't have to fully preserve it is, is right. That's correct. And we try to add some language in the plan that explains that a little bit better. That says, again, these are, you know, aspirations, but we will put all of the recommendations and all of the goals in, in a balance. Mm -hmm. And, and that will be determined at site plan. Um, I think the, the thing to remember is, Today, whether this plan is in place or not, the site is not, any none of these sites are in a local historic district. There may be some that are within a national uh, register historic places that for the for for the for the neighborhood or something like that. But even that doesn't regulate or doesn't require property to uh, preserve the building. So at the end of the day, it is always going to be up to the property owner to designate the site as a local historic district and put that in position on themselves. None of them are at the moment. Um, or not. 
Right. Okay. I'm just thinking through, um, you know, at some point, if the, the business owner said, we just want to do a partial preservation, we're not going to do the full, do you envision staff would ultimately say, well, then we're not going to recommend this project or. I don't, I don't believe that staff is as uh, <laughs> difficult to work with. <laughs> You're all very lovely. <laughs> Um, I hope I hope we can we can always bring a, a business friendly um, let's say culture when when we talk to property owners or business owners. At the end of the day, we want every business to be successful, and so the and we also have to remember is the business the property owner the building owner. I mean, and sometimes they're not. So all of those things are taken into account. I think the 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 HP staff has been very good at working with with business owners and property owners who want to meet some level of the recommendation mm -hmm. um, and and they always work with either creating design guidelines or giving them uh, recommendations for what they can do to sort to meet the sort of the aspiration to the best extent possible but they understand that it's not always possible or practical or financially feasible and the list can go on so it's very much a carrot approach versus a stick approach. It, it's an incentive yes thank you yeah um, quick question, because we've heard also from JMLCA and that they're going through this process of, of historic designation. And so what what would be the response there around their concerns around density in that particular um, neighborhood? Sure. Um, so staff has explained in a little bit more detail. We can we can pull up a map if that's easier to see. Um, the the Civic Association's concern is that this particular uh, block, or let's say, of that intersection, mm -hmm. is is really within close proximity to the Callaway Church, which is a historic uh, resource. Which I, we've actually identified it in our plan as as a significant one that we would like to have uh, full preservation for. Um, we don't think that it's that close that it could create an impact. The, the the parcel that we're talking about on the southeast corner of North George Mason is, is pretty deep. It's about two blocks away from the church. Um, any development on that site, we don't think would, would create a problem. There's certainly enough depth to be able to transition well to the single family to the south. Um, we do believe that we need the height there in order to create the the multimodal improvements along that corridor, it, it, we would need it in order to encourage the, the consolidation of those lots. And without the consolidation, we just can't get the multimodal improvements. And that's one of the intersections that needs quite a bit of attention in the future. Um, I would I would like to say that if the community goes forward and, and they're successful, which I believe they will in getting the National uh, Register of Historic Places, that is not in conflict with the recommendations of this plan. We still want to be able to see redevelopment and improvement uh, for properties that are not necessarily historic or for buildings that are ultimately, even though they're in the district, they're not necessarily historic. And one last thing I'll say is the Callaway Church um, uh, representatives that we've spoken to have said that they're they personally do not <laughs> want to preserve the building. They want to be able to retain the option in the future to even rebuild and, uh, um, and and redevelop to something else simply because they might be able, they might want to expand or create other uses that support, you know, their existing church. So that's something that's important to keep in mind uh, in the future. Thank you so much. I think we're ready to move on to our next point, which is public spaces. Yes, ma'am, uh, Commissioner Guevara. Hi, thank you. Um, so it's actually, a little related to the previous topic as well. Um, I know that there's going to be a community engagement process to determine the future of the lease center. And yet from um, the plan, it's already sort of the three illustrative um, sort of scenarios are for there to be um, senior living, um, redevelop community uses, um, redevelop to provide a new school facility. Um, I'm wondering, a lot of the community members have expressed desire to actually preserve the site. Um, why is that not being considered? Um, I know this, the county did a study on how much it would take to actually uh, reuse it. Do you know that figure? No, I, I don't know the figure, but I know uh, 
about the analysis that you're speaking about, where they, they did a, a, a more thorough analysis of the of the infrastructure and the building itself. Right. Okay. Um, and so, uh, is there a reason why reuse is not even mentioned in the plan? Yeah, and and we have been talking about this. I think since we were thinking about this um, in the land use scenario analysis, which was maybe three or four deliverables before this one, meaning we've talked about so many ways that that any of, that all of these sites along the corridor could redevelop it, and all of them have multiple scenarios, including the public facility sites. Again, we just want uh, we didn't particularly recommend preservation of the building because we knew that the county was looking at, you know, what the the feasibility of that is for that particular building, right? The issues with the with the roof, with uh, the ADA accessibility, the upgrades that are needed to the um, to the HVAC system, and and so on. They're just so expensive and and probably more more than the county should absorb at this point. And so I think it was very clear that the county didn't think it was the right the right thing to do. And perhaps having a new building that could then co-locate other uses, which we, we've heard from others have said, like affordable housing or even uh, different types of recreational community uses would probably be a good thing to think about in the future. And so what this plan is trying to do is not lock it into any specific, but simply leave the door open to consider many things in the future, depending on what the needs are. And I also have a question. Um, I know a, I've seen a lot of correspondence from community members mentioning that they either want to at least keep it or if not expand this green space there. Right. Um, why is it that um, in the figures, in, in, in sort of the scenarios where you illustrate the different scenarios, in every single scenario, the green space is reduced? That's a, that's a very good question and it's a fair question. Um, we were not, implying in any way any you know with those graphics um what a particular building footprint or site area would be we were we certainly weren't thinking about specifically saying that the, the green space could reduce we were simply looking working with colors <laughs> if i could say it that way um and just to indicate the potential you know sort of combination of uses that could occur on that site we have not done an analysis of what could fit on the property to that level of detail to say that, oh, we only need a third of the site for a park space. That, you know, by, by no means were we trying to imply that. Um, we were just trying to, again, convey the notion that in the future we could think about a, a number of, of, of uses and, a, and, a diff and different combinations of those uses in the future. I see. I'm just worried that if it is the case that it has to be reduced significantly, it sort of goes against some of the goals that we're seeing from uh, for Langston Boulevard, which is that we want to make it greener. We want to make sure that we're enhancing the connection um, to and experiences with nature. Um, if we're taking yeah. that away, I think, and in addition, if we're going to have additional density, um, that park is the only one within uh, the area uh, with area area two. So, um, and I know also the Rivendell School uses that for their children. Um, and we have a public private partnership where we use their basketball court and um, they use um, the recreational area and the playground and everything for uh, the children there. Um, so I'm just a little concerned about the future of that and how it could potentially be impacted, particularly because now this is going to be a, a this area technically would allow for up to five stories. Um, so something could be developed there that's five stories that could potentially cause uh, parking issues, also safety issues for um, you know the parents and the kids that are there. So um, I don't know, I just kind of wanted to bring that forth because I know there's sure. been a lot of uh, community consternation over the redevelopment of this uh, place. Do you want me to respond real quick? Um... Those are all uh, important questions and and significant concerns and important ones that will not be overlooked if if and when uh, the county does think about or evaluates what the potential use of those sites are, whether together or in you know in tandem with what or independently, it will go through a public process. When that happens, there will be community input. We certainly don't want to take away uh, community resources or. Um, in this case, the resource that they provide the students at the Rivendell School. I think we're 
we're trying to think, this is a plan, this is a 30, 40, 50 year plan. And the way that we're thinking about recreational facilities and amenities and community uses today may be different than how they can be incorporated in the future. Um, so I think we just have to be open to, just like schools are open to different formats to be able to adapt to, you know, to urban conditions and so forth. I think we're going to need to be open to that and, and, and just be flexible with design, but the community will be involved in the process. Um, not only in the design, but in, in the selection of the uses and, and the combination of those uses and the size and, and all of that for the site. And like you said, the parking considerations and, and the impacts of traffic. Um, and just the last thing, would you be able to provide a copy of that study that um, uh, sort of mentions how much it would take to sure. renovate the building? Yes, we can, we can uh, reach out to the facilities department and get that. Perfect. Thank you. Commissioner Lynn, tell me, then Commissioner Streiner, then Commissioner Berkey, then Commissioner Severly. Uh, thank you. Um, building on Commissioner Guevara's comments, um, I too have walked the site and I've heard from the community there. Um, that, the Lee Center and the park behind it, to the south of it, um, is a rarity up and down this corridor. And there's one thing I think that this plan, could, it's an aspirational plan and it could be a lot more aspirational about is public space um, and publicly owned public space um, to be even more specific. Um, the, that park and the Lee Center is sort of, we need more, more of those up and down the corridor. You know, that one sh needs to keep that amount of open space and certainly other uses could be done by going up but that amount of open space, recreational space, is will be vitally necessary as more people move to the corridor, as we hope will happen. And that's a good thing. Um, we have to be looking up and down this corridor for other potential sites where we could have similar uses, similar size, um, similar open space. Um, we've identified a number of triangles up and down, which is really good. Um, we. There are probably others that could come up on because under POPs, there is the aspiration that we have these generational opportunities to buy in something that we may not expect to have happen. Um, we should know what those are. So when they come up, we could jump on them and actually move ahead on them. One site that right now is not available, may not be for a long time or ever, but is where the communications tower is by the Lee Harrison Center. Um, that actually years ago was a music venue. Um, it was used in the summer for that sort of thing. So it would almost be returning it to the type of use that it used to be. Um, it's privately owned. It's totally used. There's no opportunity right now to do it other than it, you can see a lot of grass underneath the tower. But should that come up, we should be able to jump on that. Um, and there are other, if there are other sites like that up and down the corridor, we need to at least know that they're there and at least be able to say this theoretically could come up if it does, let's do something with it. Um, and I think that we could have something in the plan as a placeholder for those type of uses. Again, the, having the triangles for public space is really good because that shows that we want them to be here. And when redevelopment happens, this is places where those could be put. But a lot of those are almost pocket park type things. Uh, something larger, such as by the Lee Center or the, the park by the Mom's Market, um, you know, larger things like that um, are, are necessary. And if we can find, be able, open to that and identify that the plan that this is something we want to have in this corridor, I think it's important that we have that in there. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I will also associate myself with uh, Commissioner Lantelmi and uh, Commissioner Guevara here. Um, when I when I spoke with the members of the community, and this is more of a general comment, uh, when I met, spoke with members of the of the community, they articulated this this theme that the Lee Center for almost 100 years has been for kids and for families, and I think that you know, preserving that green space, possibly expanding it. They have that those botanical gardens there that are like very beautiful. You have all these butterflies flying around. It's a really um, it's a really peaceful kind of space. And I think um, I think just going forward as we've established that these public spaces and again, as Commissioner Lantelmi mentioned, publicly owned public spaces, there's 
there's something to that that acts as a sort of central node for the community. Um, and 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 if you look at the Lee Center's history, you know, you it's kind of like a Swiss Army thing. It was a school at one point, it's a community center. They were teaching seniors how to use the internet back in the 90s. It was really a a good thing uh, for the community, and kids still play there all the time. Um, and it's it's really something that those facilities and those areas, those parks, are something that need to be across the corridor. And I think that um, Lee Center keeping the same kind of spirit that that facility has had for the last hundred years about um, is something that's important for us to go forward doing. Thank you, Commissioner Berkey. Sure, uh, I will try to be in my best behavior, Madam Chair, and keep this brief. Um, I, I think this is quite a reasonable approach um, that, that our staff is taking here. Um, this is a framework and, and, you know, of course, we'll have a community process. A lot of folks are, are very interested in the lease on our site. And so we will have a process um, as we do with all these sites. I think that our, our Parks and Rec department um, and our, our, our staff generally uh, really should get the benefit of the doubt when it comes to our parks. I think we have an excellent park system. It's a reason why a lot of us uh, moved to or remained in Arlington. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly confident, um, you know, if if there is a process um, of what that will look like. Um, I'm also fairly confident that, you know, this site is not going to turn into a paved paradise. I think you've heard time and again from members of the community, staff. I, I don't think there's anybody who's interested in, in just making this whole site, you know, into a developable space. I think the question is, sort of what does it look like and, and how much green space is sort of preserved and what is what does that mean? Um, so I, I'm fairly confident that we'll have a reasonable conversation. Um, another reason I think this is a reasonable approach is because we have a lot of other goals in this plan. Um, housing, yes, but others. And in order to achieve some of those goals, we're going to have to have some possibly tough conversations about the compromises uh, as a community that we're willing to make. And so um, we have a place for those conversations, which is that public process. Um, and so we can have them then. But I think taking this approach here, um, you know, gives us time and space to do so. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Sarley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I'm strongly in favor of preserving this building. And, and I have several reasons for that. So one, the architect of this building, which is in particularly good condition, um, having done a quick survey of the building, um, was the, I think the Rayburn building up on the hill. So, um, you know, there is, again, it's that sort of Marty McFly family photo symptom, right? Like we keep erasing all of these things that could potentially have significant impact on the fabric and, and the quality of the of Langston Boulevard. So I think, I think this is a significant item that we ought to be preserving both for open space for the architecture. Um, I think the other thing is architecturally speaking, you know, there's a lot of homogeneity that comes from the developments that we get in Arlington. They're all very sort of cooker cutty ish and that is a bit of criticism <laughs> of the development that we get. So, you know, preserving a building that has this unique characteristic, it has an authentic historic quality to it. It does relate to the history of the Langston Boulevard in Arlington County, I think, um, you know, has a lot of merit, uh, including identification, mental health, um, for the people that use that facility. Um, so I think, you know, I think we're being a little presumptuous on this and a little bit aggressive on on, on something that we ought to be preserving. Um, I think the cost of the improvement, you know, again, and I don't mean to cast doubt on the assessment that it was, but it's much like sort of preserving a classic car, right? Like, um, of course, you can have a brand new car a lot cheaper, right? But it's not the classic car and the classic you know car has a lot of qualities a lot of pride a lot of identity associated with it that we ought to be a little bit more conscious as a community you know um again i go back to the 2015 i think uh commissioner Hill, um, um, senator hill hillebrand i think made the comment that arlington is a soulless place you know 
that's all fun and games up to the point that you actually stop to think about it. And she's not completely wrong, you know? And I think this is a unique situation where it does reflect soul and place of Arlington County. And for us to lose it, you know, um, at what cost is sort of where I'm coming at. I think there's this tangible cost and then there's the intangible cost. And I would say that this is a mistake to put this on the chopping block. Um, that's it. Thank you. So, um, okay, last comment on this topic, Commissioner Garada. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I sort of want to respond to Commissioner Berkeley's comments about um, that we have multiple goals, right? I am a huge proponent of affordable housing, but I think that there's a false dichotomy that's built um, when we say it's either going to be affordable housing or we have to give up our green spaces. I think we can be uh, a little bit more creative um, with how we approach affordable housing, perhaps going after developers, making sure they put uh, on-site units and all of that, as opposed to saying, okay, now we have to give, give up our green space because we need affordable housing. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, you know, as we have now noted, if you had 930 on your bingo cards, folks, we've now passed that time, but we are approaching our last topic, sustainability. Anybody on sustainability? Commissioner Guerin. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I thank you, Madam Chair. I want to reiterate what I raised at the RTA and, uh, you know, note that we've heard from a lot of folks today about the opportunity to plan with climate change, sustainability and resilience in mind, including planning for greater density. These are great goals, but I want to underscore another opportunity we have here to likewise incentivize reusing the buildings that is definitely more eco-friendly and it may help preserve our existing uh, green space in some areas. So I'd like to see, make sure my colleagues feel the same way and make sure that goes into the record, I'd like to prioritize repurposing existing buildings where possible and possibly find ways to incentivize that. Thanks. Okay, that was our last topic. So um, we are now on to motions. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Lynn, tell me. Sure. Um, I move that, that the planning commission. Your mic, please. Hmm? Your mic, oh, please. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I move that the Planning Commission recommend adoption of the following elements associated with the Langston Boulevard planning study by the County Board. A, resolution attachment one to adopt the Langston Boulevard area plan as shown in attachment two. B, resolution attachment three to adopt the general land use plan GLUP map and booklet amendments as shown in attachment four. C, Resolution, attachment five, to adopt the master transportation plan, the MTP, map amendments as shown in attachment six, and D, ordinance, attachment seven, to amend, reenact, and recodify the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance sections 6.1, 7.12, and 12.3, as shown in attachment eight. Is there a second? Second. And Thank you. I have an amending motion that. Um, <laughs> OK, okay. Um, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the county board direct that the retail priority designation for the Lee Heights shops site to Glee Broad be along Langston Boulevard be gold rather than blue as in the draft plan. OK, is there a second to the motion to amend? I second that one, too. OK. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Is there, do you want to say anything about that or do you think we've covered it? Uh, I think I gave my my reasons for it before statement. and I think we've pretty much discussed that yep. quite a bit if anybody wants to raise anything else. Yeah, nope. All right, so welcome back. <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> um, all right, so we have um, Commissioner Lentelmi's um, motion to amend, seconded by Commissioner Streiner. Did you want to say something? Okay, good. We are ready to vote on that. Nope. Oh, you have an, okay, Commissioner Guerin has a, an amendment. Too. Well, I'd just like to explore if there's um, interest in this. I move the Planning Commission recommend the County Board request staff to develop incentives to repurpose existing buildings as part of plan adoption for the benefit of sustainability and resilience. I second. second. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So, what do, yeah, do we have to do That's one at a time? That's not true.
So, okay, before we before 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 we move on that one, yeah, we have to we we this one doesn't have to do with the first one. So we've got to move on um, gyms yes. that's been seconded by Tony. Um, all right, so Commissioner Bagley, aye. Peterson, nay. Garen, aye. Uh, Weir. Uh, a point of clarification: We are voting on Commissioner Latelmi's correct. Motion, correct. Thank you. Uh, in that case, nay. Um, tell me. Aye. Streiner. Aye. Sarley. Aye. Robertson. Aye. Gavada. Aye. Berkey. Aye. Patel. Aye. Um, that motion carries eight to two. The, yes, the 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 main motion now is amended to include or to this language. Okay. So um, let's move to Commissioner Guerin's motion then, right? Because she can, it is germane to the main Is that motion. amending my motion, the main motion, the main, or is that a standalone? I think, I think it, it's germane to the main motion. So she can. Okay. I just want to make sure. Well, that's, I mean, it's a good question. Can we do it as a standalone? Or do you think it's germane to the. Uh, uh, I would defer to someone who knows more about individuals <laughs> than I do. Okay, let's 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 just keep it clean, and we'll do it as a. Uh, what did you say? If you want to do it as a standalone, we have to act on the main. Motion yeah, first. right. So, so that's what I said. We're, we'll do it very cleanly, and we'll just go ahead and vote on the main motion withdraw now. Yes. Can you withdraw without objection? Mm -hmm. I'd like to withdraw without objection. Perfect. All right. Let's move. <laughs> let's vote on the original one. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. Um, let's let's vote on the original one now as amended because of our vote. Uh, okay. I yes, actually sir. have a. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. So this is this is I think consistent with the main motion. Uh, I move that the planning commission recommend that the definition of enhanced bicycle facilities on page eighty four of the uh, draft plan be amended uh, to include the phrase consistent with appendix C of the master transportation plans bicycle element. I'll second that. Is this an amendment? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that that's an amendment because it's germane. It's it, it's modifying the main. All right. Amendment. That's yeah, mm. that's fine. Okay, who who seconded it? tell me. I did. Okay. All right. I think it's self-explanatory, right? Can we vote? Bagley. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Garrett. Weir. Aye. tell me. Aye. Streiner. Aye. Sarley. Aye. Robertson. Aye. Gibata. Aye. Berkey. Aye. Um, Patel is also um, an I. All right, that motion carries without any objection. We have 11 people, so what happened on that last one? Oh, that was nine to two. Um, Mr. Pfeiffer, that last motion to amend was actually nine to two. Yeah. Um, all right, so now we have the main motion as amended by our two amendments, Lentelmi's and Weir's. Are we ready to vote on the main motion now as amended? Perfect. All right. Bagley. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Peter Garen. Aye. Weir. Aye. Lentelmi. Aye. Schreiner. Aye. Sarley. Aye. Robertson. Aye. Gavada. Aye. Berkey. Aye. Patel. Aye. That motion carries 11 to nothing. So no, no um, nays on that one. All right. Garen has a standalone motion. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the Planning Commission recommend County Board request staff to develop incentives to repurpose existing buildings as part of plan adoption for the benefit of sustainability and resilience. Second. That was seconded by Peterson. Um, back, second. Back. Oh, sorry. She, I'm excited. she seconded it. <laughs> uh, let's go to our vote. Uh, Commissioner Bagley? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Aaron? Aye. Weir? Aye. Lentelmi? Aye. Streiner? Aye. Sarley? Aye. Robertson? Aye. Gavada? Aye. Berkey? Aye. Patel? Aye. That motion carries 11 to 0. Are there any other motions? Then tell me, do you have a motion? No, Weir has his motion. Uh, I move that the uh, Planning Commission reiterate its recommendation from uh, the October 2 hearing uh, that uh, it, that the um, that the county board and staff prioritize uh, the reconsideration of the East Falls Church and Cherrydale uh, plans to take a holistic and comprehensive look 
at all of the Langston Boulevard corridor and its housing needs and opportunities. Can I have sure. a clarification sure. point of clarification before anybody seconds it? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Are you fixing it before I ask for clarification? Yeah, uh, okay. yeah I'm okay. going to. Please. So just give me maybe one moment to okay. put it to write something so that I can send it to the clerk. Um, but while you're doing that, perhaps, uh, perhaps I can answer the question. Um, I just wanted to know if, based on the guidance that's been provided by the county board, um, including a time frame, which I believe was three years, is that, is that right, Ms. Smith? Was it three years that was said? Yes, zero to three, short term, okay. is what the county board asked for. Okay. Is there, are you, are you designating a time frame in there? Short term. The short term. Okay. I just want to make sure we add that in there as well. Um. Give me one moment to just clarify the text so that I can read it without thinking, without writing it aloud in my head. Um, Will there be any other motions tonight? Okay. Sure, I have one motion. Okay, come, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I have mine written. Um, all right, my motion is I move that it's the sense of the Planning Commission that it supports a countywide effort to identify new tools and strategies to preserve and achieve more affordable housing related to a review of the affordable housing master plan. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay, seconded by Guevara. All right, let's vote on it. It was, can you say one more time, Commissioner Berkey? Glasses. Sure. It's too small. I, I move that it is the sense of the Planning Commission that it supports a countywide effort to identify new tools and strategies to preserve and achieve more affordable housing related to a review of the affordable housing master plan. That was seconded by Guevara. Commissioner Bagley? Aye. Um, Peterson? Aye. Guerin? Aye. Weir? Aye. Um, Lentami? Aye. Greiner? Aye. Darley? Abstain. Robertson? Aye. Guevara? Berkey? Aye. So, aye, that motion carries 10 to 0 with one abstention. All right, are you ready? The, I move that the Planning Commission reiterate its recommendation that the County Board and staff revisit the East Falls Church and Cherrydale plans in the short term, taking a holistic and comprehensive look at all of the Langston Boulevard corridor and its housing needs and opportunities. Okay. I second. second. Shiner? No, 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 he's too dead. <laughs> we all did together. <laughs> okay, all right. So we're, yeah, can we say it one more time? Uh, I move that the Planning Commission reiterate its recommendation that the County Board, uh, its recommendation from the October 2, 2023 hearing, uh, that the County Board and staff revisit the East Falls Church and Cherrydale plans in the short term, taking a holistic and comprehensive look at all of the Langston Boulevard corridor and its housing needs and opportunities. Um, is there, may I ask a question about this? Uh, this one is specifically related to housing needs and opportunities, but is there a way to expand it to include, would you have uh, appetite to want to expand this to include um, not just housing, but also transportation. I, I would not object to that at all. I, I am the, the reiterating. I I had language available to me for copying and pasting. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, so, but but I would not object to that. Okay, so may we now just uh, can can I, I do we need what's been seconded? So can we just? I, I think that that the the. The, the way that I would suggest doing it is without objection, mm -hmm. uh, striking the language and its housing needs and opportunities, um, mm -hmm. because uh, we have already talked yes. about a holistic and comprehensive Perfect. look. Um, so that would be everything. So I, I would just ask that it actually say a comprehensive look at all of the needs and opportunities existing in the Langston Boulevard corridor. All of the needs and opportunities. Um, so without objection, the motion would be Edit would be amended to read the Planning Commission uh, reiterates its recommendations that the County Board and staff revisit the East Falls Church and Cherrydale plans in the short term, taking a holistic and comprehensive look at all of the needs and opportunities, uh, and opportunities uh, in the presented in the Langston Boulevard corridor. Is that is that your is who's seconding now? 
I seconded it. Okay. Well, one, one of us did. It was three, three of well, us. Well, this is a new five. one, so I need a new second. <laughs> Commissioner Robertson seconded that. Okay, okay. Commissioner it's, Robertson. Uh, it's a motion to amend the amendment without objection. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right. All right. You got that, Mr. Piper? I'm sending it to you. Do you have the second on that? Okay, yeah. that's who That's who I have, too. All right, ready? Bagley. Can I make a quick nope. comment to that? Sure. I will strongly support this motion because you had me at holistic. <laughs> that's where I think we're lacking, you know, and any time that there's holistic planning approach to Arlington County, I strongly support that. And <laughs> Okay. Bagley. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Kieran. Aye. Weir. Aye. Tell me. Aye. Striner. Aye. Sarley. Aye. Robertson. Aye. Gavada. Aye. Peterson. I'm sorry, Berkey. Aye. Patel, aye, right? <laughs> that motion carries 11 to 0. I think those are all the motions for tonight, uh, Mr. Pfeiffer. Thank you so much. Unless my colleagues are, are, we, are, are pocketing a motion right now. We acted now. on the main motion, right? Yeah. We acted on the main Yeah, motion. that was right away. Okay, so listen, amazing work. Thank you so much. It takes so much to get these meetings done, and we would not be able to do it without the talented and amazing um, county staff. Um, we thank everybody, Ms. Harrison, Ms. Johnson, um, everybody from um, CPHD, everybody from DES, everybody from everywhere, um, all of our community members. Thank you um, for being here. And this November meeting of the Planning Commission has Mr. Pfeiffer ended before 10 p.m. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> all right. Thank we're, you. We're adjourned. And we're at the thank one you. yard line for PLD. So thank you. But if we're doing price of right rules, I know. <laughs>